Okay, so what you should be seeing now with some modicum of hope is a large screen with, with candidate briefings. So I can see uh, Ginny and Sean there. Can you thumbs up? You, can, you got that? Excellent. All right. Let's push this up to there. Okay, so let's kick off. Um, we, we, of course, uh, have an agenda, and you can see that on the left-hand side, but importantly, uh, I'd like to pay my, and on, on your behalf, our respect for the traditional custodians of the, of the Queen in Palarang area, uh, the peoples on whose land we live and work. We acknowledge that these lands are Aboriginal lands and pay our respect and celebrate their ongoing cultural traditions and contributions to our surrounding region. So in terms of presentation this evening, um, I invite uh, my colleagues to, to raise their hands. So I'll be uh, kicking off the presentation going through a number of matters. When we get to the planning portfolios and projects uh, section of the agenda, uh, then I'll invite in, in this order, Mike Thompson, who's our portfolio manager of National Built Character, uh, Jackie uh, Richards, who's our portfolio general manager, community culture, and uh, then Phil Hansen, who's our PGM of Community Connections. Okay, let's kick through. So, so I thought it appropriate just to make sure you are aware and you do avail yourselves, of course, of all the information that, that is available on the NSW Electoral Commission website. I won't go through it, uh, but again, most information that is standard across all councils and all candidates and all councillors is on that particular website. Uh, there are rules, uh, there are information around what it is to be a candidate, uh, what it means to become a councillor, and of course we're all promoting the opportunity to, to expand the diversity that our council represents uh, in terms of gender, uh, race, race, ethnicity and, uh, and sexual preference. Um, I should alert you early on that there are some rules that are set by legislation and standards around signage, and, and this becomes a, often a vexed issue, more so around state and Commonwealth elections, but these are the New South Wales rules. So under various forms of legislation, there are rules around election signage. On the left-hand side of the screen, in essence, they can be no more than a 0 0.8 square metre, which is around your, your AO size uh, sign. They can be placed on private property, on fences, as we see. If it's larger than 0 0.8 square metres in size, you need developer consent. But I should alert you, the period of time to get developer consent is weeks. Uh, for a thing like that and and often you may not get the consent by the time the election takes place there are some rules around placing those on heritage items uh, the the electoral commission and in the local office will guide you around how far away your signage can be from the pre-polling and the polling places and the extent to which your your uh, polling assistance and, and scrutineers can be uh, within those polling places uh, but in very very broad terms there are the standards are that uh, prior to the election for five weeks, then the uh, electoral signage or postage uh, can be displayed up until the day it, it's held. And then of course, one week immediately following, and we would expect that the candidates would then, or their teams would then remove uh, that signage. You must be aware that if the signage is placed on public lands or, or road reserves, they, they are actually not permissible. They are in the ACT, but not in New South Wales. So therefore, um, if you don't remove them, uh, we shall. And that includes things like the core fluid signs that you see quite pro prolifically uh, along roadsides, again, particularly in the ACT. So in very broad terms, about an AO poster size is the falls within that 0 0.5 square metre of, uh, of, uh, of signage. Um, in terms of, of, of some key dates, so... Uh, these are on screen. So pre-polling, pre you would be aware, um, is already happening now. Um, the postal votes uh, take place again, uh, or they're already in place, and they conclude on the 29th of November. Polling day, naturally, is the 4th of December. The advice we've had, no doubt you've had as well, um, from the electoral office is that between the 22nd and the 24th of December is, is when the poll is expected to be declared. Now, we could be as late as the 24th of December, uh, particularly with a large number of candidates. We are the largest candidate group in the, in the region, uh, but uh, with the, we do have a large number of groups, so that may ironically assist um, the, the uh, count. However, we are also mindful that there is, if there is some dis, uh, dispute around the outcomes or the count, there could be a request for a count back, and that will delay uh, the poll, poll decision. 
Regardless, all councils are required to conduct their first meeting uh, three weeks after the declaration of poll. So at this point, we have scheduled the first meeting of the, of the new council for the 12th of January of 22. So we're flagging that now so that uh, many of you may be making holiday arrangements. So we would, we'd urge you uh, to be available in person uh, for the 12th of January. However, if you are not available for that 12th of January meeting, you can attend remotely by Zoom and we'll provide that information to you. But prior to that, you must in person undertake the affirmation or the oath. And I'll go through that in a moment with you. So pending the timing of the declaration of the poll, we may conduct an oath ceremony on the 24th of December. We may not, just depends how that works. Uh, that would be convenient because if you are able to attend in person, then we can also distribute to you uh, the laptops, mobiles, and indication of the training schedules. Uh, so you are aware of those in advance and make available uh, times for you to learn the system in terms of our digital systems. So at the extraordinary meeting held on the 12th of January, the primary purpose is to elect the mayor and the deputy mayor, then to nominate the various council law delegates to the various committees, advisory committees, section 355s, board, boards and the like, and to make a decision on the meeting schedule for the remainder of the year. I'll touch on that in a moment. The next meeting, uh, while it would normally be on the 26th of January, you know it's a special day, so we've brought forward the ordinary meeting of council to the 19th. And then from the following month, we would propose to continue our normal schedule of meetings being a planning and strategy meeting on the second Wednesday and the ordinary council on the fourth Wednesday of each month. But on screen there, you see the typical things that would uh, be discussed at those meetings. We're also scheduling a, uh, an induction day, which will be independently facilitated at, at the Carrington Inn at Bungendore on the 29th of January. And again, uh, we'd urge you to make arrangements to be available for that day and on that day. Uh, in addition, we are all obliged to all councillors to make arrangements or councillors to undertake a series of training, uh, particularly around the code of conduct, code of meeting practice, uh, conflicts of interest and the like. And they've been scheduled uh, at various times across the 3rd and 4th of February, but they are online. So that's the candidate information. And here's, it's a lot to read there on screen, but, but these, these are the requirements of, of government. Uh, around the, and legislation regarding the oath or affirmation, you have the choice of taking either. So it must be at or prior to the first meeting, it must be in person, and it will be the first item of business on the first uh, meeting of council on the 12th of January. Um, you can undertake um, the oath separately by a signed statement, but again, we would have to record that in minutes, it becomes a public record that the council law has undertaken the oath or the affirmation. Uh, I'm happy to be available for you to take that oath prior to the meeting uh, if you are actually unable to attend the meeting on the 12th of January. Again, um, they, we can make arrangements to work, work around it. It is a difficult time across the Christmas period. We recognise that. But all of New South Wales is in a similar position. So the current arrangements with meetings, for those who aren't aware, is we have an order, what's called an ordinary council meeting on the fourth Wednesday of the month. It normally commences at 5.30, normally concludes by 9.30. The current code of meeting practice allows a half hour extension. Uh, you can see on screen the things that we would normally uh, discuss or determine at, at an ordinary council meeting. The council, which is the uh, decision-making body ultimately, has, has delegated authority to what's called the Planning and Strategy Committee of Whole to undertake particular decisions around strategy, planning, development, environment, and things that are available under the Local Government Act and under the, under the Environment Planning and Assessment Act. And that meeting is held on the second Wednesday of each month, again, starting at 5.30. Every alternate Wednesday, we hold a workshop with councillors. And that's, uh, again, commencing at 5.30 uh, and typically around the things you see on screen. So councillors uh, have wanted to get some further background information have a free discussion, guide the staff about how they'd like a particular matter to be uh, put forward so that when they receive the formal report, they're well informed uh, and they have uh, all the information available to them to help them make an appropriate decision on the evening of that particular meeting. Prior to, the day prior to the ordinary meeting and the planning and strategy meeting on the Tuesday, the second and fourth Tuesday at four o'clock, we hold a briefing session. 
And that's to take the councillor through, again, the background of the reports, issues that may be emerging. They can alert us to things they might be hearing in the field, as well as more broad briefings and, and, uh, and questions uh, from councils. So you can see that, that uh, every week, uh, there is either a council meeting, a workshop, and or a briefing um, that uh, we would uh, seek your attendance at. Um, council laws and mayors are remunerated. Uh, those fees are set by the Local Government Remuneration Tribunal. We're known as a regional centre. And for that purpose, uh, council laws are paid $20,000 and almost $700 per year, paid monthly. Uh, the mayor in total of the mayor's allowance and the council allowance receives $65,000. And those councils who are required to attend from their place of residence to the meeting or from uh, their place of residence to a, a meeting at which they are a, a confirmed delegate of council uh, can claim their travel at between 70 and 80 cents per kilometre based on the uh, litres in your particular vehicle. And those claims uh, are lodged um, through our governance staff and, and we uh, pay you monthly. And of course, uh, in this time of COVID, meetings have changed. So, so the legislation has now moved uh, and, and it, it's a great thing because it does assist more candidates and more uh, members of the community to participate in the meeting. So we can now conduct meetings entirely in person, uh, entirely un, under Zoom, or more likely it's going to be a hybrid of both. And so we have set up the chambers here in Queanbeyan where all the meetings will now be held uh, to, con to undertake an in-person and or a uh, Zoom meeting concurrently, and we're finding from experience that enables a lot more members of the community, ironically, to attend, where they can make their presentations during public forum, they can attend the meeting for that section they wish to, and because all of our meetings are live streamed and archived to the website, they can always come back and have a look at those particular items later on. Uh, typically, we will deliver your business papers uh, via our, our Microsoft Office 365 suite, which will be loaded onto your laptops um, by the Friday evening prior to the council meeting on the Wednesday. So we are obliged to have those available three working days prior to the con conduct of the meeting. Every Friday afternoon, you will receive what we call a council of catch up, about a you know, 10 to 12 page bulletin of the things that have happened during the week or that are coming up so that you are well versed in things that might be media releases, uh, projects, uh, progress, uh, con controversial matters that might be turning up, and we'll include some confidential matters, uh, particularly around some developments that have not yet been considered, but you should be alerted to in confidence. Uh, so that material is, again, also emailed out to you uh, every Friday. As I indicated before, at the council meeting on the 12th, um, you will be nominated to a range of boards and committees, which include local and regional. Uh, they, are, they are not remunerated. Um, so they become part of the role and you can see the sorts of things. They'll either be management, what we call management committees or advisory committees, but there are some boards that we also participate on at a regional scale. So once you are a councillor, uh, you're also obliged under legislation to undertake professional development. So we will be uh, moving you towards a host of uh, opportunities um, led by the Office of Local Government or by Local Government New South Wales or by the Canberra Region Joint Organisation, where we can collaborate and provide that training either in person or online more efficiently. And again, those particular items on the right-hand side of the screen are available to you to get a handle on what sort of things are expected uh, of our new councillors. So are there any questions that, at that point around uh, the candidature and the council law stuff at this point? Happy to take a breath. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, you're all well, well aware of, of, the, of the geography of our area, um, over 5,300 square kilometres now, of course, from, from east to west. Um, our population is growing quite rapidly. So we are, uh, frankly, um, about, if not the fastest growing inland regional LGA in New South Wales. We're currently growing about 1.8, 1.9% per annum. And recently there was some uh, further work done by the Regional Australian Institute uh, post-COVID, which examined uh, the rate of migration from metros into regional New South Wales. Uh, Queenie Palarine was in the top 10 of Australia in terms of taking up a lot of the, um, absorbing a lot of the migration out of capital cities. So on screen there, you can see what the populations are at the moment and how they've grown between all of our major towns. 
At the bottom of the screen there, you can see a hyperlink to our, uh, our profile. Now that covers a lot of information. It covers community information, uh, demographic information and economic information. I urge you to become familiar with our past, current and future forecasting for population and our economy uh, in particular. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, you can see uh, what is the projections for the population, the number of households. We're roughly same, staying the same size in terms of average household size. And of course, we're seeing uh, quite a significant increase in the number of dwellings uh, in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. The right-hand side of the screen are the forecasts for each of the suburbs and the towns in our LGA. Again, all the information is available on our profiles on, online. We are also part of a number of uh, regional groups. Uh, we uh, tend to lead uh, many of those given the size of, of our organisation. Uh, so, so we're a member of the Canberra Region Joint Organisation. You can see the right-hand side of the screen and the member councils of that, which does include Wagga to the west, uh, East Gippsland and Victoria to the south and all those councils around and including the ACT. On the left-hand side of the screen um, is the regional cities New South Wales. We're currently uh, part of the executive of that, and that has uh, 15 regional city members, the Dubbo's, Tamworth's, Oranges, Albury's and Wagga's, for example, around the state. And we've also established a MOU with the ACT government. Uh, it's, uh, it will be refreshed and presented to the new council probably around February of next year, uh, which will again start to address those areas of connectivity, cross-border matters uh, across our uh, matters that we need to deal with uh, between the ACT and particularly Queanbeyan. Now, I've noticed that uh, Marita's now joined us. I've got a, a TK. I can't quite tell who that might be. Is that Mr. Talbot? Is it? Let's try to see who else I'm missing here. So I've got Marita there. TK, uh, can you indicate who you might be? No. Oh, Sorry, what? Peter, that's, um, that's Antonio. Antonio, thank you. All right, terrific. All right, welcome. Um, again, uh, for those who have just come online, happy to take questions by using the raising hand icon, uh, or if that fails, certainly speak up. We, we, we do have some regular pause points to ask questions. So Ginny, Ginny has a question, Peter, so far. Ginny, I can't even see her. I'm here. Sorry. Oh, there you are, Tom. Yes. Just give me focus. Um, okay. Thanks for that, Peter. I was just wondering if you could give me some insight into the types of cross-jurisdictional matters that you um, would be raising with the ACT government. So just sort of those types. Oh, of yeah. There's there's a host. We probably have around twenty items all up. Uh, so it covers cross-border development. Um, so alerts to each other about what's happening each side of the border, particularly around uh, cross-border connectivity. Now, those items are principally around the integrated bus network, mm -hmm. potential for light rail or rail connectivity, Bungendore through to Kingston. Uh, a lot of issues around uh, impacts of climate change, energy, uh, renewables and so forth, the different policy positions of New South Wales compared to ACT. Uh, broad population planning. Uh, we're looking to collaborate on a thing called a city deal, uh, which will become a joint initiative and funding sought through the Commonwealth Government, by way of example. Great. Thanks for that. Sure. So in terms of integrated planning, um, we, are, we are obliged, all councils across the state, to use a number of key documents to guide the strategy settings, the policy levers, the infrastructure plans uh, and the community programs um, for our LGA. The primary one is a thing called a community strategic plan. Um, we've undertaken at a regional scale and per LGA community engagement in the last few months. Uh, you will receive uh, the outcome of that engagement and the priority initiatives uh, early in the term, but we are obliged to have a new community strategic plan together with a, what's called a delivery program, which are the programs and projects you propose to uh, deliver the ambitions of the community and an operational plan by June 30 of 2022. So again, on the bottom of the screen there is the hyperlink. Uh, you can take that and you'll see under integrated planning, the current host of community strategic plan, DP and OP as we call them, and our thing called the resourcing strategy. The other key one we have there under, under um, planning generally is a thing called a local strategic planning statement. Again adopted by the current council about 18 months ago after uh, many months of work. 
Again, all councils are required to do so, but it is frankly the intersection between the local environment planning, which is the statutory planning instrument, and the community strategic plan, which is the ambition setting of the local communities. And that will set, set apart what are the key drivers and actions around land use planning, environmental planning, infrastructure planning, community planning, and so forth going forward. So that is a key document that will require revision again by the new council once you have considered the CSP or community strategic plan. We then also publish a thing called a resourcing strategy. And that really is the thing I would urge you to have a look at uh, prior to the election. It captures what is the capacity and capability of the organisation. So what is the finances, our workforce, our assets, our digital and our uh, capacity and our risk appetite. Uh, we, we, we bundle that together, find the golden thread and, and articulate what are the key issues and responses and plans to uh, continue to deliver services in an environment of uh, constraints, particularly around finances and skills uh, in our region and that out right across the community. Was that a thumbs up you've seen it already, Katrina? Uh, Peter, thanks for that. I just wanted to ask a question. Has the resourcing strategy actually been published? Uh, it was endorsed by the council at the last meeting. It'll be on, on the website, I think, tonight. Okay. Can, can, sorry, can I just butt in there, Peter? It's up on the website now. Um, right. I think it's on that hyperlink that was on the previous page, the budget okay. and planning page. So, yeah, it's definitely up there. Thanks, Ricky. Thank you. And uh, going to this council meeting next week is our annual report for 2021. Again, I'd urge you to take a look at that because that basically is a snapshot of the position of all the projects and programs and performance of council across the last 12 months. Um, you'll see a lot of this. Um, it is a, a schematic produced by uh, government around the role of councils, its, it, its obligations to reflect a host of state plans and strategies to work with the, the joint organisation that's called the JO and the, and the relationship between the, I'm going to use the abbreviations now, the CSP, the DP and the OP. Community Strategic Plan, Delivery Program and Operational Plan. So that, and hence you can see the resourcing strategy is the point at which the capacity of the organisation is disclosed to deliver the ambitions outlined in the delivery program. So the current CSP, uh, again developed when the new council came into place in 2017, follows five strategic pillars, community choice, character, connection and capability. It comes as no great surprise to you, of course, that our organisation has been designed and structured around that. Uh, so the portfolio of general managers in the room today, uh, Jackie is around community choice, uh, Michael is around character, uh, Phil is around connection, and we're currently recruiting for our GM for organisation capability. So under each of those particular pillars, we have a range of services and programs. You can see uh, there's 25 services, 120 programs. Those who have been involved in government would be familiar with that type of thinking. And, and there are a host of activities that support that range of programs. So we've basically structured around portfolio GMs being responsible for the strategic pillars, service managers, goes without saying, uh, and program coordinators, then activity team leaders. So we've laid the organisation by bundling uh, certain uh, services and programs together uh, where they rest well and we can, we can sit well with, with our, um, the resources we have to, to deliver for the community. So we, we report uh, to the community, both in our plans, operational plans, and our half yearly reports on progress, and our annual report against those particular services and programs. Uh, every two years as well, um, the council undertakes a community uh, satisfaction or a survey. Now, this is the 2020 results. And so while our overall ranking in terms of satisfaction was 3.5 out of a score of five, we take a view that the scores of less than 3.25, we have a closer look at. And so in relation to the last survey, uh, you can see in the red box, things like footpaths, environmental monitoring, weeds, economic development, tourism, building inspections and DAs were things that did not get a satisfactory score in our view. And so they're the ones that come under, under gaze where we review process, we review resourcing, we review means of delivery, uh, and the ones that we're having a particular look at at the moment are around economic development and development applications. So when they come forward uh, to the new council in the new year, uh, we'll be presenting ways that we can improve the, the, the means and uh, cost of delivery. Bill, you've got a hand up. 
Thank you, Peter. Um, good day, everybody. Um, do you have a, a, more, a, a breakdown of the, of the community satisfaction into, into areas such as um, satisfaction in Bungendore or Braidwood or Neriga yeah, so or Araluen for that matter? Um, to a large extent, um, they are brought, they are uh, captured in catchments, which tend to be around Bungendore and District and Braidwood and District. Yeah. Uh, they are on our website. Again, under integrated planning, you'll see uh, the community satisfaction survey. Ricky, um, that's under the same integrated planning part of the website. Uh, different part, but I'll post the link in um, there. I'll, I'll post that link in there now. All right, thanks very much. So okay. again, that material is available to you. Um, again, um, we, we do use that information to help guide how we price our services. Now, uh, of course, uh, rates of, are a tax. They are on land, a bit like Commonwealth and the state. Uh, there are a number of our services that are priced based on pricing policy around uh, market pricing, competitive pricing, uh, and we consider, of course, what they call community service obligations. So, again, you'll be asked as a new council to review and, re and revise the current distribution of our costs against which particular services and the pricing structures around that. I thought this is useful to you to help uh, get your heads around what are the types of decisions a council would normally make. We break them up into two areas being planned and unplanned. So in the blue area, we try to have a, a reasonable rigour around uh, providing evidence before we make a decision, particularly around our strategies and plans. So we'll undertake a range of studies, it might be a traffic study, it might be an environmental study, an economic study. That will then guide a strategy which goes to council and the community that often will then lead to a plan which will have a range of actions, timeframes and deliverables. Uh, we'll pull the key actions out of those strategies and plans, embed them into the community strategic plan, again, as that primary do a document. The ones that have been funded to be undertaken during the term of council end up being uh, articulated in the delivery program and the operational plan. And we indicate the resources we set against those in the resourcing strategy. And then we commit to indicating how we go against those ambitions and plans in our half yearly operational plan report and our annual report. So the means of engagement with the community in the middle of the screen there is we use a thing called the IAP2, the it's International Advocacy uh, program and the forms of public engagement tend to be around involving, consulting, informing, and collaborating. But things happen during the course of the year. There might be things called a COVID or a bushfire or a big grant program or a stimulus turn up. So the plans that the council may set in the operational plan may need to be adjusted, and that can be adjusted by a resolution of council at a, any particular meeting. So we, we we will find, and you will find the regularity at which government will, through its legislation, devolve responsibilities onto council, often without any compensation for that. So we have to bear the cost. So, so any changes through legislation or election commitments or a change in programs or policy will have a part to play on how we need to pivot in the way that we operate. Likewise, a councillor may come on board with a particular platform and would want to nominate a number of projects or initiatives uh, into our next delivery program or through notices of motion. Uh, ultimately, all of our decisions are led by a decision of council or the planning committee. And you can see those items that would typically take place on screen. The executive who are in the room with you today, the virtual room with you today, then activate those decisions of council through our organization structure, through our programs and policies, and often with our partners uh, through collaboration with the Canberra Region Joint Organization or the ACT or state agencies or otherwise. Uh, and again, uh, it's, a, it's important to have our organisation structure reflect our service framework, and we have delegations that empower staff to undertake those works and activities on behalf of council. Likewise, our projects, they just don't turn up, but I have to say some do. So if there's a good idea that turns up from a council or, or an MP or a minister, it, gets, it does turn up in our books. But generally speaking, our projects are led by strategies and plans they go through a number of years of initiation, evidence-based, business cases and options uh, before it turns up in our delivery program and our operational plan, as you can see on screen. And again, uh, we run a, a range of project governance uh, to ensure that those key projects remain on track and we publish the results of those to, to the council. 
So I mentioned this before, the IAP2. So that's a, a quick snapshot of the forms of public engagement that we undertake. We tend to move primarily around inform, consult and involve. Uh, we do collaborate particularly where there are other partners, uh, which might be another agency or another LGA or the ACT, where it does uh, involve different uh, levels of collaboration amongst the community. So you'll find in our documentation that we'll publish what form of engagement we propose on a particular project or program or initiative. Any questions on those so far? It's a lot coming at you pretty quickly, I appreciate. So let's talk about our resourcing then. Um, and again, a lot of this material is available in our resourcing strategy. So our current budget is around 300 million and roughly 50-50 uh, in terms of operational, our ongoing costs uh, and our capital uh, budget. But of our, of our OPEX or our operational budget, again, uh, around 150 million uh, of our uh, income comes from, uh, is expended on our operations. So you may, like many members of the public, think that all the rates go towards the full function of the council. That's not so. About half of all of our income comes from taxes or the annual charges for water, sewer and waste. Around a quarter each come from grants um, and a quarter from our fees and charges. So you can see that that's in broad terms where most of our income comes from. And in, in general terms, fees and charges are a fee for service whereas grants contributions are the, uh, typically the sorts of uh, efforts of our staff who go seeking grants from other levels of government to assist and deliver the programs and projects of council. Likewise, around a quarter of all of our expenses go on staff, not 100% as many people tend to think, and almost half of all of our expenditure goes on contractors and materials and supplies, either in the LGA or the region. A large chunk, uh, does go in the cost of depreciation. Depreciation are, are funds that are uh, amortised, if you like, that are required to continue to maintain and renew assets, in particular going forward. And at this point, around 2% of our budgets are expended on uh, principal and interest for, for loans. I, I mentioned the organisation structure. Was that a question I heard? No. Uh, so you can see there the org structure I mentioned earlier. So our four portfolio general managers uh, who would then have uh, a number of service managers reporting to them. So we have uh, in total uh, 14, 15 service managers um, and we also have an asset specialist reporting, reporting to fill. So our, org our organisation has grown in size since the merger. We're currently a bit over 460 full-time equivalent staff, but probably around 500 uh, also headcount when you, when you add on the part-time staff and casuals and the like. But we have maintained, at better than the former councils, the number of staff per 1,000 residents. So at time of merger, we're above 7.5, and we're below that at the moment in terms of our staff per 1,000 residents. And like a healthy organisation, we have around about 10% annual turnover. However, at the moment... We are going through a run like many councils across the state where we are losing a lot of our professional staff, particularly planners, engineers, finance, health and building inspectors to the private sector while the big development boom and construction boom is going on. And while we have a host of special activation precincts and Snowy 2.0 nearby. So it is quite a, quite a draw on our resources at the moment to, uh, to be able to um, retain and re appropriately remunerate and attract staff into it. So I think in our development team at the moment, we're four or five down, and that's certainly having an impact on the turnaround of our DAs. Okay, so on to financials. There might be a few questions in here. So the council adopted at the time of merger uh, in 2017 its financial strategy. Again, I'd urge you to go online and have a look at that. Uh, each year we revise it. Uh, the council was due to revise the financial plan uh, this year, certainly when we expected the election at the end of September. So early next year, you'll be asked to have a, a revision, no doubt with a series of workshops prior to that, of the long-term financial plan. The key elements of the current strategy are on the top left-hand side of the screen. You may change those, but they're fairly broad. And of course, the bottom uh, left-hand side of the screen are the current uh, levers, policy levers used uh, to balance the books. Uh, in terms of managing a growing population and a growing infrastructure base 
and the combination of which increases the demand and spread of services generally. So one of the key tools we use to help monitor and plan for how we uh, resource uh, the services and assets is this thing called the narrow the gap. Now that's, that's contained in the financial policy of council. And the way it's described is this, um, and I'll try and use a um, special pointer here somewhere, if that helps. Uh, so these are our typical costs for maintaining our assets, maintaining renewing assets and servicing debt for those assets, against which we receive the rate in the dollar for our general rates and our water, sewer and waste annual charges. At the moment, there's a gap. Likewise, for all of our non-infrastructure services, community services, environmental development and the like, we charge a range of fees for recovery. We do assign our base rate, which is on the general rate towards the services and a financial assistance grant and uh, other operating grants. And again, there's a gap. So we monitor how we track with this as to what other grants we can attract or we revise services or revise asset standards to help narrow that gap going forward. Now, this model is now being taken up, that's been developed by us, is being taken up by many other councils across the state as a good visual tool to articulate where rates and annual charges should be spent and where the base rates go towards services, generally speaking. And again, that's contained inside our financial policy. Um, a lot of the questions we get asked has been, well, uh, council's cutting costs, services are reducing, not spending money wisely. So let's look at some evidence around that. So just after, after um, uh, merger, of course, there's a thing called a special schedule one, which publishes uh, the operating costs, the operating expenses and the net cost of operations. So for our general fund activities, governance, admin, health, environment, excluding waste, uh, recreation, transport and so forth, we were spending about $97 million with the various forms of, of service income and operating grants. It was a net cost of $51 million. In 2020, I haven't updated this chart with the 21 financial results as yet. Uh, we, did, we have now commenced attribution on a lot of our overhead across all of our services. So yes, we have seen some increases in the net cost of services around health, certainly in the area of environment, uh, certainly in the area of recreation and culture, and most certainly in the area of transport and, and, uh, and the roads, paths and otherwise. So we have seen a, a, a quite a significant increase in our net cost when you take into account fees and grants, which is around about 3 to 4% per annum. But the real test is how we compare to the rest of the state. So the model called the Local Government Grants Commission um, takes uh, uh, financial data uh, assessment every year, and they do a thing called a per capita um, disclosure of the costs across all councils in New South Wales. So the typical cost per capita of the cost of governance administration is around $244. We are well less than that at around 113. The typical cost for public order, safety, health and environment is around 162. Well, we're about the same as that. Our big differences are in the areas of infrastructure. So we spend more than double the average per capita compared to other councils in New South Wales on transport infrastructure in particular. But we do also spend in the area of uh, development and economic activities and tourism, which is called effort neutral. In other words, that's a choice of council to spend in that area. So if you take off that $27 off here, we're probably $1,050 per head we spend compared to $950 per head on average across the rest of the state. Ginny. Um, yeah, just a quick question about why we're spending so much more on infrastructure. Is that because it's ageing, it needs replacing, or like what's, what's the deal? Well, I, I, I could well leave that uh, to fill a bit later, but the reality is uh, the current council made a decision in 2017 via its financial strategy, via its asset plans, to invest heavily in the renewal and replacement of, yes, aged, infrastructure. So that's why we've been spending a lot of money on renewals, resheating, reshading, and rebuilding a lot of our infrastructure across the last few years. And this is only general fund. It does not include water and sewer, which has a similar issue. So it'll probably, I'll come on to that because you can see here, uh, having asked that question, Ginny, 
here's the, here's the effect. So that's the value of our assets. As a consequence of the improved um, condition of our assets and the construction of new assets, a lot of which have been gifted through new development, let's say Google, for example, our asset base has grown from 1.5 billion to 1.725 billion. Importantly though, at the time of merger, only about half of all of the assets were in good to new condition. That's now all, we've moved that through our investments, the renewal and replacement, upgrading and building new assets to almost three quarters. The big okay. change has been, the big change has been those that have only been in a just satisfactory average condition, uh, which was then around a quarter of our assets and now just 10% of our assets. Hope that sort of helps clarify that question for you. But here is, here is the issue that we're confronted with, like many councils across New South Wales, but particularly growing councils, particularly growing councils in regional areas. Uh, so this is not uncommon to us. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, we see uh, as a consequence of natural disaster, um, stimulus, COVID, any form of grants that have been emerging. So new or upgraded assets bring with it, yes, a brand new shiny piece of infrastructure. Uh, and you can see the value of what we're inheriting to continue to maintain those assets to the standard that they're now constructed as a consequence of being a grant funded project, as well as the combination of depreciation, which is essentially forecasting what it will cost to replace or renew that asset. Now, renewing or replacing an asset is like reselling a road, for example. So we're, we're averaging now around $1 million a year in additional uh, combined maintenance and depreciation costs or forward-focused forward uh, renewal costs from assets as a consequence of the large amount of grants that we've been able to attract into our LGA. It's a similar position as a consequence of what we call gifted assets. Now, they are the assets that we inherit once they're commissioned as a consequence of development such as a Gugong or Trali or, or Bungendor, for example. Same sort of deal. We're then obliged to set out a, a path to maintain those in our asset plans and also a path to renew those assets as they come due, usually around a 10 or so uh, a year cycle. So the combination of both of those is around $2 million on average per year that we've inherited from dedicated or gifted um, uh, uh, granted uh, assets. Katrina, you had a message, a question? Yes, thanks. Uh, but that's that's not the sum total of depreciation costs, is it? Like no, no, no. At, at, at the bottom of the screen here, uh, our depreciation uh, is probably this year over twenty million dollars. So at the time of merger it was twelve, then it's moved to nineteen mil, and now it's probably over twenty mil. I, I've yet to see this year's financial uh, statements, but we've been increasing our depreciation by about ten percent per annum. So what are the other sources? You've just talked about uh, two point one million. I know the. The EDE is another one million. That's three point one million. What what are the other sources uh, for that the, that remaining the balance of that depreciation? Experience? So so again, we can take it on notice if you wouldn't mind, uh, Caitlin. So we can articulate what has been the growth in the new assets each year on the financial statements. You'll see those on some special schedules appended to the annual financial statements. You'll see the growth in new assets, and as a consequence of that, you'll see the growth in depreciation. If you want to know which particular assets, we can provide that information to you. So, so on to rates and charges. Um, so these are the comparisons between 2016 and 2020, the residential and business rates. Now rates and charges include general rates, which is a tax based on land, as well as the water, sewer, waste and stormwater annual charges. So you can see here that there has been growth in orange uh, into, uh, compared to what the rates were uh, in 2016. And, and the real issue here has been the growth, certainly in water and sewer charges, particularly amongst uh, Braidwood and Bungendore. So that's a pretty good graphic to understand what has been the growth across the last uh, four or five years. But this gives it to you in, in, a, in a better sense. So in 2020, we harmonised the general rates between the former Queen and former Palerae. Last year, uh, or this current year, I should say, we've harmonised the waste charges, which has seen the distribution of a general waste charge to all uh, ratepayers compared to just the former Palerae. And uh, 
from next financial year, we'll also be looking to harmonise the water and sewer charges. So here is, of course, you've seen this particular table at our community forums. Uh, the, the rates and charges for particularly around Bungendore, Braywood, Captain's Flat and broader Palerang have gone down compared to previous years. And likewise, businesses in those areas, partly because of the redistribution of the rate burden through harmonisation. So because there are a lot more rate payers and rateable properties in Queanbeyan, their rates have gone up by tens of dollars. As a consequence of that harmonisation, the rates in the other towns have gone down. And that will be the case for the next a couple of years as well. Uh, the council has yet to make a decision. You can see here the very large difference in the water and sewer charges that were inherited through from Palerang uh, compared to those in Queanbeyan. So at some point, the council will need to make a decision, should they or should they not start to harmonise the water and sewer charges in particular between Queanbeyan, Bungendore, Braywood and Captain's Flat. So that'll be a big decision in the next six months. Um, the financial ratios, these are all the things that, that are the benchmarks between uh, all the councils across the state. And you can see all of those particular benchmarks have improved uh, since merger through 2021. Uh, Kate, Katrina, you had another question? Um, yes, thanks. Sorry, could you go back to the previous slide? Uh, my question is <coughs> about that. So uh, one of the complaints or comments I've heard quite a bit in um, Braidwood, uh, because I've been out there probably a bit more than Bungendore, um, is about the the high charges. Um, so, and they've they've said they've been told it's a legacy issue. Is that what you mean by saying these were the the sorts of charges that were inherited in 2016? Correct. And and so, secondly, when you say we have to, we'll have to decide whether to harmonise them, uh, I can't imagine people in the um, the old Palaran communities will be happy to pay such high differential in fees if they certainly if they don't feel they're getting anything for it well it's, it's exactly the, the converse katrina so the former palerang are paying very high water sewer charges compared to queenbian so it would be the other way around mm -hmm. queenbian residents would be paying more to offset reductions in palerang okay thank you so so a decision of council would be to leave it as it is, as a legacy issue, or harmonise it. So it's quite, quite the converse to what you were saying. So the other issue that has, co has course been amongst uh, the community and, and council has been this thing called this structural deficit. So, so just to give you a sense, at the well before merger, so merger took place in 2016, and that was the uh, injection of merger and other grants from government, which changed our, our financial ratios. But when you look way back the last 10 years, the, two, the combined results of the two former councils were not pretty. But the reality is the structural deficit inherited and now in the new council is vastly improved. So we still have a structural deficit of around 4 to 5% that we need, need to deal with. The financial strategy adopted by council in 2017 recognised that issue, proposed a mix of cost reductions, merger savings, an SRV of 1% every year, and water and sewer dividends to bring the structural deficit to heed. A rate freeze was imposed by the state government in 2016, so none of the merged council were able to move their rates above CPI or the rate peg until last year. Many of the merged councils have. In fact, many councils across the state have, um, just, just to keep up with those costs. So the new council will need to reconcile uh, to either maintain the current financial strategy or take a different approach to attend to the structural deficit and to find the means to continue to um, remain in the black. But I, mu I must emphasise the council is not broke. Its condition has improved significantly and is on a path to continue to improve, subject to those policy levers being activated. We've also heard a lot of commentary around debt. Um, the government has been pushing councils in particular to take on more debt. It makes a lot of sense that in an environment where we can borrow at fixed interest rates for a 20-year term, in some cases between 2% and 
and up to 3%. So it would make sense that while debt is cheap, there is a high propensity of government to distribute grants amongst LGAs across the state and to continue to build infrastructure that might either need to be new infrastructure, upgraded or replaced. Raising debt smooths out and eases the cost across several generations to do so. So on screen you see here is what is the current forecast of debt that has been raised or will be raised under the current financial strategy uh, since merger. Katrina, you have a question? Um, it's actually uh, another candidate, Greg. I'm mm -hmm. on the Greens ticket. Thank you, Greg. Um, Peter, just going back to your last slide, sorry, I was a bit slow on the uptake here. Um, in the broad, you're saying there's still a structural deficit. I think in the broad, you're saying that that has to be addressed by the new council, but presumably the staff of the council have a strategy in mind for dealing with that um, ongoing structural deficit. And could you just outline what that um, preferred strategy might be? So, so, so again, it's, it's all been published in the council reports. Um, yeah. Again, it's published in the resourcing right. strategy. That, that'd be good. Yep, so, so that's, all, that's all available to you. But in very broad terms, it continues to revise services, to revise the means of delivery and pricing of those. Uh, it talks about, yes, uh, and a special rate variation above seats, um, the rate peg. The thing that changed for us has been that we were uh, strong advocates around the IPART review of the rate peg which, to accommodate population growth. So with us growing at 1.9%, we had expected that uh, above rate peg, we would also receive a, a mandated increase of 1.9% above rate peg. However, the government chose to reduce the population rate peg by what we get as uh, new properties being generated by development. So that effectively has probably dropped our um, improved rate revenues through IPART to around a quarter of 1%, about 100,000 a year. Sorry, can you just explain that? That doesn't make sense the way you express okay. it. So IPART, independently of government, yep. independently of council, set a rate peg each year. Let's say it's 2%. Yep. Uh, in addition to that, IPART set a population peg above that to accommodate growth. That will only commence from next year. It has not commenced yet. And so if our council uh, has a population growth of 1.9%, the rates will increase by 1.9% above the rate peak. However, and that's what we understood to be the case. However, the, count, the government has now announced that it will deduct from the population peg increase the amount the council received from supplementary levies. Now, that is the rates received from new properties that have been added to the portfolio. In other words, as a consequence of 400 new lots being developed at Gugong yep. each year, yep. we, might, we might gain 400,000 in income. Yeah, it might be equal to half a percent, so you get 1.4%. Well, so instead of getting 1.9%, we might get 0.25% because they yeah. deduct the value of the supplementary levy. Yep. So um, what sort of rate increase over the next three years would be needed to eliminate the structural deficit? So, again, I don't have a financial strategy in front of us. My recollection is it's in the order of 2.5% per annum across the next three years above rate peak. Is Kate online? Uh, Kate, can you recall what that um, what that proposition was? It, it's not in, it's not adopted by the council. It's a decision to be made by the new council. Yes, Kate. Um, hi, Peter. Yes. So the one of the scenarios that we put to council in our long term financial plan um, included an SRV, and it was um, six point nine percent. So this is the total special rate variation, yep. um, which includes the rate peg. Yep. and includes what we understood at the time to be the population peg. Yep. Um, then we, so the, the total rates increase, including all of that and including the SRV was 6.9%. Um, and that was proposed to have started from the 1st of July. And how many years would that apply to? And then there was two further years of increases. So the cumulative rate peg over at the end of the three years um, was, and again, I'm going from memory, 27.8%? 20, yes, that's it, 27.8%, which right. is 
um, an increase in year one and then an increase on top of that, an increase on yeah, top of that. Okay. It's around the 7% each year. And just to finish off on this, and I'm sorry to labour it, but obviously that's a big hit. So it has been a bit of a um, election issue going into the December 4 election. Am I right in saying that a higher proportion of Queanbeans rates are in arrears through for hardship reasons than is the case for other similar councils in um, New South Wales, like, say, Orange or Albury or Bathurst? Um, because... we'll, we'll answer that in a couple of ways. and Kate might have some comparative numbers. But you might recall the council extended its hardship policy uh, to accommodate drought, bushfires and COVID. And so it basically created an opportunity for, for members of uh, the rate-paying community to defer or go into payment plans. As a consequence of that, quite a number of took that opportunity. So, look, it's not out what we would call traditional hardship. It's more a case of an opportunity to ease people through the stresses that have taken place across the last couple of years. Our normal, our normal um, outstanding rates is in the 3 to 4%, I think, Kate, and we're now at about 10, you were saying, was it? We're, we're under 10%. Yep. Um, the benchmark for councils our size is 10%. Um, but we're only just under the 10%. So um, we can certainly provide and look up comparative figures and you actually you would be able to find them. The New South Wales government has a website of all of that comparative yeah. data. Yeah, I've so looked on that. public information there. Yep. Um, however, um, I would say that we're at the benchmark or we're, we're below just below the benchmark. We're not exceeding the benchmark. We've exceeded our own benchmark because we've increased um, on what we had previously. So in the broad, we've got a high amount of a high-ish amount of arrears, and we're potentially subject to the new council asking people to pay just shy of twenty-eight percent extra over the next three years. The, yeah, the timings. That the timings seems like a very big ask, doesn't it? Horrible. Well, well, let's 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 reflect that the increase above what would be mandated by IPART is about ten percent. So, so let's, put things, let's put things in perspective. The increases that we mandated by IPART as a consequence of the rate peg and the population peg is... It's actually 12.5%, 12, it's, uh, 12 I think, but I can, I can check that right. in a minute. But yes, yep. correct. Yeah, and, and again, again, to ensure there's no um, scaremongering, it's not 25% in year one. It's yeah. spread across three years. Yeah. It's a proposed SRB subject to council deciding on that particular pathway in the new year. And I should also point out that, that there are processes. So if the council chose to adopt that approach, it must undertake community consultation. It must present its decision to undertake to propose an SRV in November of each year, uh, conclude its consultation, confirm its intention to continue with an SRV by February of the following year, and then IPART will make its determination. It's still been up to council that even if IPART does approve a variation, Council still has an opportunity whether to take up that opportunity or not. So there are three points at which a council can choose to proceed, to stop or defer. Okay, thank you. All that right, seems uh, like a big hit, a very big hit. That understand. Bryce, you had a question? Just unmuting. Thanks. Thanks, Peter and team. Um, just wondering, the depreciation level, I assume it's set by state government like IPART. There's no, because obviously that feeds into the gap. In, in you know, uh, so it's it's a set rate for different roads and different majors, etc. So there's no, um, you know, so I'm getting it's, it. it. It's it's basically set through the accounting codes, which do articulate yep. what's the level yeah, of appreciation so. by the class of asset. It's 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 influenced by our own asset management plans and our condition assessments. So, for example, there there'll be a large adjustment to our financial accounts this year when they're published at the end of the month. Um, as a consequence, of, as a merge council, we've had to completely revalue all of our assets this year independently by a third party. And that's based fundamentally on the condition, the physical condition of the asset and the assessment of the remaining life of the asset. And that resets to an extent uh, the depreciation levels. Thank you, Peter. That's what I thought. But thanks for clarifying. Cheers. Sure. Thank you. OK, I'll continue on. Um, the, matter, the matter of debt on screen here. Uh, all of these are the proposed purposes of borrowings across the next half dozen years. Uh, all of these, other than the EDE, are being funded by um, uh, are proposed across a 20-year time frame at, at, at between 25 and 3% fixed per annum. 
you can see on the right hand side of screen that uh, many of those, if not the bulk of those, are being met by other forms of income, either directly by development contributions, by the savings that we had preset uh, as a consequence of merger uh, and building savings, uh, or by lease income. So there's a range of, of uh, new principal interest charges per year for a range of projects across the LGA, uh, some of which are certainly being funded by, by rates. In fact, only 20% of all the PI costs are being funded by rates, the remainder are being met by uh, savings, by development contributions, and by lease income. And I would point out that again, we have been urged, like all councils, to use debt as a means of smoothing out uh, the capital spikes and lumps that most councils are faced with. Um, on remuneration, I'd indicated to you before that the council laws and mayor receive uh, income uh, paid monthly. Uh, we do also have other costs relating, relating to catering for civic function, functions and meetings where that would take place, or the attendance of councillors at conferences. You can see the last financial year has been a lot less because there have been more remote meetings and, of course, uh, conferences have also been remote. But there has been some commentary about the size of uh, mine and staff uh, remuneration. Um, I don't get paid more than the Prime Minister, which has been put forward apparently. Uh, so that's my salary there. It is published in the annual report and it's at the 55th, 55th percentile of councils of regional centres across the state, just to put that into context. So on some broad planning matters, any further questions on financials before I leave that? Yes, Katrina. Uh, can you tell us uh, what is, is there a plan for how to expend the revenue raised by selling the council's CBD properties? I understand a tender uh, was accepted for the, the block um, adjacent yep, yep. to the new um, headquarters. Yep, I'll touch on that in a moment. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right. So housing is a big issue for us, and, and no doubt you've heard a lot about. I've just finished a long session. In fact, I haven't moved from this chair for about eight hours today, I think. So we had a long session today with um, regional New South Wales, housing, DPIE, and other agencies around the regional housing crisis. It would come as no surprise to you that our LGA is one of the worst in the state in terms of rental vacancies and affordable vacancies, which is the, the broad per, uh, barometer for affordable housing. But I wanted to make it clear um, on the left-hand side of the screen, the role of local government across Australia plays in housing. And it's quite minimal other than the role of zoning land, having service land available, and for de develop, uh, dealing with development applications and, and then ultimately raising rates from that land. The bulk of the affordable housing rests with the other two levels of government. The New South Wales government in the last few months have released their New South Wales Housing Strategy 2041. Uh, the bottom of the right-hand side of the screen, you can see the key pillars of supply, diversity, affordability, and resilience. Now, those are the areas that we see a great deal to play with local government. And indeed, there will be a stronger relationship between local councils and looking at new solutions for housing, including a better engagement with community housing providers. So there will be further announcements coming out. We believe that we've positioned ourselves to be a, a pilot with the state, given uh, the housing prices here, our proximity to special activation precincts, regional job precincts, Snowy 2.0, and so forth. Um, and uh, of course, it's not just housing for uh, residents, it's housing for all the jobs coming into our LGA, including government jobs, and particularly around housing, uh, particularly housing for health, police, and teaching. And indeed, the government has announced, uh, I think, $30 million to put in particularly into health housing across the state in regional New South Wales. We are all obliged to follow certain codes that are established by the government and they, are, and they cascade in our own development controls and guidance around our assessment of plans for subdivisions, our assessment of plans for residential accommodation and the like. And ultimately we fall into a hierarchy of strategies and plans across the state. So while there are the, the broader housing strategy for New South Wales, there's also this thing called the South East and Tablelands Regional Plan. It's currently under revision. Yes, Bill.
Sorry, I, I noticed on the previous slide, um, if you wouldn't mind, the livable and desirable. Uh, sorry, I tell a lie. The next one, the blue box. Um, a variety of housing types is compliant development. Um, yep. Dual occupancies, for instance, uh, offer an alternative to freestanding homes. We heard, uh, many of us heard last night, that some of the areas of, uh, of QPRC, um, dual occupancies are frowned upon uh, at a council level. Um, wouldn't it be uh, wise of us as a new council if we get there to, uh, well, facilitate more uh, dual occupancies, uh, development of granny flats, uh, et cetera? I'm sure you know, Peter, that uh, housing and rental housing in particular is in crisis situation in Braidwood. Um, I suspect it's pretty much the same as Bungendore, but Bungendore didn't get 120 new uh, mine jobs in the last two years where um, Majors Creek did. Um, and many of them have put pressure on, on uh, housing and, uh, and affordable housing, as several people have raised over the last few meetings. Um, wouldn't it be cognizant of us to, to uh, promote uh, the development of deal occupancies and, and in a sense, fast track them or reduce the delays. Yeah, look, um, I, I know you're talking about um, staff shortages, but yeah. um, deal uh, is uh, a, a big issue out here, Peter, I'm sure you know. Sure, and, and let's make that clear that there, there is no opposition at all to dual occup occupancies and granny flats and the like. It's a case of, for example, Braidwood being a heritage area listed across the state that's not supported, particularly where it changes the configuration and heritage character of the area. And particularly as any developments of that scale above a single dwelling require referral off to Heritage in New South Wales. And often that takes six months to just get a response back. Mm. But Mike, you might, you might just introduce now, while I have you, um, just to, to make clear um, what is the, the type of housing that we accommodate. Um, and you'll, for example, there are a lot of, there's a lot of terrace housing going into the new developed areas. But you might particularly speak to infill, Mike. Yeah, so most of our infill infill type housing will occur in either the uh, urban areas of Queenland or around the inner areas of the existing uh, towns of Bungdor and Braidwood. You've outlined very well the the constraints of doing that in Braidwood. And there's um, constraints there around the maintaining the, the Georgian street layout and, and lot layout in, Bung in Braidwood. And so it's uh, quite a complex issue to try and overcome that. Granny flats are, are, are a good way around that though. Granny flats can be put in a lot of, dif a lot of different places without re-subdividing the land or or selling it off. So granny flats are one way to do that. So um, the issue yeah. last night was raised was was out in the E4 area out in Wamboin Baiwong of of uh, a woman who um, was desperate to get a, a an additional house for her disabled daughter, and it sounded quite well. I don't know the story. I don't know, the, but I got the impression that um, they felt constrained, whether whether it's right or not. They felt constrained by the E4 rating um, zoning um, and that they weren't allowed to have dual, you know, two houses on the same lot. Um, I know subdivision can be problematic because you don't want to keep making everything smaller and smaller and smaller all the time. But, yeah, but no, multiple yeah. houses on these large blocks of land, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 acre blocks, seems eminently sensible and we bring back a sense of community and, and families living together. For, it it may, appear, may appear that way, Bill, but I can assure you, it if we put two houses on every every block of land we had out in the rural residential areas, we would not have the infrastructure to support those in those areas. Yes, I don't think every two every place is going to have two houses. The same as every place is not going to have a granny flat. But I think that this it's about a mixture and it's about allowing dual occupancies when when requested and granny flats when requested because it's it's going to. Without without extra subdivisions tagging on the outside edges of towns and villages all the time. Um, uh, it, it, it's they used to call it consolidation um, back in the day in the Campbelltown area, but um, you call it infill. Um, you know, just putting put more people. And I understand that the infrastructure and then the roads and the, you know the, the waste disposal, etc., etc., all the roll-on things. But it, I just thought it's, it's, it's written into a plan 
why would there then be resistance to it? So the, look, you can put you can put um, granny flats on uh, E4 land that um, some people want to put much bigger bigger granny flats on than are allowed. That's usually the reason that people have base constraints. So the, the granny flats a percentage of the floor area of your existing dwelling. And sometimes people want to put a, if they've got a smallish dwelling, they want to put a bigger house, uh, secondary dwelling on than is permitted. So that's usually where that constraint is. Yeah, but is but, that a problem, like seriously? Yeah, um, but that can be, that can certainly be addressed by increasing the percentage. I think it's 33%. For and is that so, something that we could do as an elected council? Yeah, yeah you certainly could. That's a, a, a requirement that we could look at. It could go up to 40% or something like that. Okay, thanks. So, so let's... Let's park that there because that's very typical, Bill, the sort of things we conduct under workshops prior to any reports coming up. So thanks for the question. Uh, again, on screen, if I can keep going, uh, you can see the hierarchy of how we sit. But what's important is uh, the Southeastern table, Tablelands Plan is currently being rewritten, revised through uh, Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, of which we will play a part. Uh, you can see how we sit in that hierarchy. So that will be a significant guide to both the regional housing and local housing strategies going forward. So again, we often hear, and I'm sure you hear about, you know, why do things take so long or be uh, this particular Bunganor structure plan has just been announced. Why is us, we're gonna have 12,000 dwellings on us tomorrow. Well, you know, it's not the case. So on screen here, again, extracted from our local strategic planning statement is typically what would be the time frame between a strategic vision being established, let's, through, let's say through a planning study, might be a rural land study, before it gets into a local environment plan, before it gets embedded into a structure plan and a contributions plan, before a DA starts to get contemplated, before a subdivision starts to get uh, developed. So depending where a particular idea comes into place at a planning proposal, which is an, a rezoning, through to master planning if a subdivision has been approved, through a DA for a house to the building and occupation, it can be quite a number of years. Uh, we are going through a process now, of course, where the Bungadore structure plan has been adopted. All the contribution and control plans have to be subsequently revised. Developers come in with their UBU master plan overnight and they expect to have DAs approved tomorrow. So we also have obligations to seek the concurrences and advices of state agencies they take their time, but we share the frustration of both the development community and the mum and dad house applicants uh, at how long these things take. Um, part of which is the, the ambitions of government to continue to, to plan for the reshaping of major regional centres such as ours uh, under this thing called the movement of place framework. And that emerged under the uh, transport for 2056 uh, strategy of government, which starts to articulate in our areas, for example, movement corridors through local streets and turning town centres into places for people. So we've designed our master plan for the CBD around that framework, but we equally have to rethink around the uh, distribution and movement of traffic and trucks, partly accommodated now because of the EDE in Queenbin, for example, about rethinking about how we can manage movement of trucks, heavy vehicles and noise through town centres. And the final couple of things now is around, again, we are obliged to follow our decisions and planning for assets. Uh, council has adopted an asset strategy. It's adopted a series of asset management plans. The actions out of those merge in the operating plan and then how we deal with the maintenance and renewal of those assets. But graphically, not perfect. Uh, all of our assets, as you saw earlier, were categorised between one through five based on their assessed condition. They, in turn, uh, depending on their condition, will uh, catalyse a certain type of action. So if, if an asset's in brand new or good condition, we'll just do routine maintenance. If it's wandering between condition two and three, we'll start to do more important regular routine uh, schedule maintenance, such as resheating and, re and resealing, before we have to get down to rehabilitating or replacing that asset. So earlier you saw we, we put a lot of effort in converting, which was then over half of our assets in a fair condition, to move them into the one and two categories, uh, which has been the investment efforts of council through a combination of grants and debt across the last three or four years. 
And of course, Council in recent years has also adopted its climate change uh, action plans and adaptation plans for the community and Council. That also is a key feature of our integrated planning and the way that we look to design uh, greenfield developments, how we change our operations, how we increase um, the, the uh, minimise the heat island effect, how we reduce our emissions, how we increase our, uh, our reliance on renewable energy sources and reduce our wastes and water consumption across the LGA. And my final bit now then is around some of the key projects and some of these you mentioned a bit earlier. Oh, Katrina, I missed you. Oh, sorry, yep. um, Peter, it's yep. Greg again, but yep. I am a candidate. I'm legit. Can uh, you just... Can you just remind me what the emission reduction targets are for both the council and the community climate action plan? Yeah, that slide. Yep, certainly, Mike. The, the community is uh, um, um, zero by 2050 in line with the, with the uh, New South Wales policy, it was at the time. And I think we Net might... zero by 2050 for the community one? Yeah, uh, but I think we might have just, the New South Wales government uh, just recently changed that to... Um, 2030. Yeah, 2030. So we've, we've, um, we've indicated that, I think, in our, in our plan. We've revised our plan to reflect that. Um, and uh, it's a similar figure for the uh, internal uh, council operation plan. So are you saying they're both net zero by 2030? Um, I, look, I, I can't be sure of that, but I can remember that we, yes, we did, we did um, adopt net zero by 2050. That was what was adopted by council. But I, I just have to have a look at what that variation for the New South Wales requirement was. So, 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 so basically, Greg, the, the uh, climate action plan is pitched against the state policy. As a state policy shifts, so, so we will pivot around that. Uh, so the new council will need to revise the climate action plan based on that uh, state government's ambitions. And some of the actions, of course, we've taken up around electrical, uh, electric vehicle charging station stuff. But our biggest one at the moment has been around uh, migration of, of our street lighting to LED uh, and going through a, a purchase power agreement for renewable sources which I think in the main almost gets us to the uh, close to the net zero effect anyway, in terms of our emissions, Mike, from memory. But uh, with the um, community one, are we trending down every year with community emissions? Like, are we cutting it by three, four, five percent per year? Or yeah, we, we report against that, Mike. I'm not sure I've said yeah, this year's one. Actually, right actually, there's a there's a uh, update in the uh, summary. State of Environment report that's going to council. Yeah, the report. So you'll be able to you'll be able to view that. But but that, it, keeping in mind that it's a community action plan about how council um, supports the community. It is not council. Council is not driving the community. No one's driving. Action. That's the problem. No one's driving it. That's so the problem. community emissions are they going down? And if so, by how much? Yeah, I can't tell you that. I'm sorry. So, really. so you don't know. Look, look, you know, he knows it's been reported in the State of Environment report going to council next meeting. You're invited to have a look at that. Right, but you can't tell me now. No, sorry. Right. I have to take that on notice, Greg. Can I just ask, this slide says that these plans were updated on the 20th or published on the 20th of October. Are they online now? Because I never heard anything about them being updated, like in your weekly bulletin or... Um, uh, yes, they are. Katrina, it's Bryce here. I had a look this morning. Okay, thank you. Okay, we, we might move on, just conscious of time. Uh, so that's the, the Queen Bean Civic and Cultural Precinct, which is currently under construction. Uh, basically, the red lines are where a number of staff currently are. About 11 buildings around the CBD uh, is where we have uh, around 200 or so staff. Uh, they'll be vacating those upon the construction of this facility. Uh, which is a five-storey and seven-storey uh, um, development with basement car parking, public plaza, and connectivity between ultimately the river through to the queue and this public domain and through the uh, showground across the road. Um, we'll find that um, that didn't work. So in terms of the $74, $75 million project, which is on track, around about um, half sorry, three quarters of that ends up being community or council admin, around uh, a quarter of the overall project, but over that is 
commercial build, so in other words, to attract and retain government agencies and commercial operators, including smart hubs. Uh, the, the debt for that portion of the commercial is being met by lease income, the principal and interest for the debt for the community and council admin elements are being met by merger and building savings. So contrary to a lot of the noise, there is no rates going towards the servicing of debt for this new piece of infrastructure, which adds more car parking spaces, adds more green public domain, and adds an ongoing income stream for the council uh, as the rent income exceeds the principal and interest, which is fixed for 20 years. So this is how the building uh, will look. Uh, the ground floor will be customer service. Uh, the right-hand side here is a, is a glass uh, colonnade that connects the Bicentennial Hall through to the Q Theatre. The council chambers will appear above, uh, sorry, here. Uh, the new library will be here. These two levels here will be council staff offices and the next three levels will be commercial let, uh, including two government uh, lets. So it'll be quite a, a significant change to the, to the landscape. Of course, the trees are being retained. They've been sort of faded out through here. Uh, and Katrina, in relation to your question uh, next door, whoops, got that, oh, thought I had it, I apologize. Um, so the section behind the fire station and um, I'll go to here actually, fire station through to here, all this parcel of land here, uh, council has accepted an offer going through due diligence at the moment, uh, where the purchasers take occupation of that once we vacate these premises and go into here. So that's likely at this point, the building is expected to be finished around um, at the end of 22, then fitted out to enable occupation around March of 23, at which point we'll vacate the buildings that we currently occupy and they become available for the purchaser uh, to start development. Uh, presumably in that period of time, they would then apply for the type of development uh, through the joint regional planning panel, uh, A, because it would be in council's name and B, because the scale of that development would be under the jurisdiction of the joint regional planning panel. So does that cover off the question you're asking? Uh, a little. Um, why would the application be in the council's name if you're selling the land? No, I didn't say it was in our name. I said we it would still be under our ownership because settlement doesn't take place till March of 23. Okay. And my question, my earlier question was actually about ha have you e uh, earmarked um, how to spend the proceeds of the sale? Yes. So the, the proceeds of sale are being placed into working capital. Um, so that was a previous resolution of council quite some months ago. So because debt is so cheap, at the moment, uh, the, the bulk of the QCCP is being debt funded. The proceeds of the sale uh, are being placed into working capital, A, to improve the financial cash position of council going forward and to make those funds available for other purposes. Okay. The other item that uh, no doubt you're hearing about is the Bungendore High School. Uh, just to fill in the blanks, uh, the government is now compulsorily acquiring from council the land that the council owns under freehold or manages under crown. So those parcels of land are what's called 2 to 10 Majara Street, 2 being the community centre, uh, two blocks of vacant land that was previously assigned to Abbeyfield and the council offices. In addition, it's acquiring the road reserve of Majara Street and around a 15% slice of of um, Bunganore Park. They are also acquiring around 4,500 square metres, about an acre, of Trello Reserve across the road. So the current state development, as considered by Council in October of 2020 and, and part of the um, DA, is that the government proposes to build a new community centre, a new library and a customer centre in the school precinct. So that would mean that the current library which the former council contributed to, would be relocated elsewhere on the school precinct. The parcel of land that we had dedicated to Abbeyfield will be relocated to this part of Majara Street, which will be closed. So around an 1,800 square metre site for Abbeyfield, and we're working with those uh, for, their, uh, for, the contain, uh, for the creation of the lot and for their DA processes at the moment. So that's the current DA 
That's the current proposition that council has received and the compensation for the sale of its freehold, the sale of the road, and the sale of its rights, so to speak, to the Crown lands will be determined by the Valuer General, independently of both parties. Uh, that will be subject to the issue of what's called a PAN, or a Proposal to Acquire Notice, under compulsory uh, laws, under the Just Terms Acquisition Act. And then we would then uh, uh, provide our determinations of appropriate compensation compared to what the value of general determines. So that would normally take a 90 day process depending on when that PAN is issued. We have not yet received that. Uh, but as far as any other questions around the process and timeframes, that will be a question that we would both collectively need to ask of education. So the new council will need to make a decision. Uh, we'll need to work on a number of things. One is we have purchased the site on the corner of uh, Gibraltar and Ellenden at 19 Gibraltar Street for the purpose of a new office in the centre of town. It's possible that that site could also accommodate a new community centre and library. That is our preferred position, but that would require the valuations and compensation provided by government to fully fund a relocated office, library and community centre. Ginny. Thanks, Peter. Um, so, yeah, just my question is around the um, planned office space. Um, are you going to activity-based working? What's the options that you're looking at there? Yep, yep. Um, both, both the office premises will be based on ABW. Okay, right there. cool. Okay, um, and, then, and then, of course, we're also entering a number of uh, joint use or shared use agreements. Uh, so the way that looks is that uh, we can also, out of ours, share the high school library. Rather, we will now have access to quite a large hall, being the multi-purpose hall proposed with the high school. Uh, education is constructing two games courts, which become available for the community out of school hours. They've, of course, moved the floodlights, irrigation and goalposts, of course, for Mixture at Oval itself. Uh, we'll also have access to the new uh, footy oval and amenities and floodlights at the primary school. So those will be all subject to joint use agreements between the council and education, making those sites available out of school hours for the community use. And happily, that will be the end of my bit. Are there any questions uh, before either A, you're invited to have a quick stretch of the legs, uh, and then I'll invite um, uh, Mike to start to talk through some of the planning development matters. Katrina. Can we have five minutes? Yep, how about we have five minutes? We'll come back at 22.
Okay, I think uh, we're mostly back. Hands up those who aren't back. That's the joke for the day. Let's do it, Pete. <laughs> Good, thank you. All right, Mike, um, you might unmute, your, unmute, unmute yourself and I'll kick off. <clears throat> Thanks, Peter. So uh, I just want to introduce our portfolio has uh, four different sections, land use planning, which is strategic planning, the long-term planning, development, which is the day-to-day -day planning, your development applications and those sorts of things, health and natural landscapes, which are our regulatory provisions relating to health and our regulatory provisions relating to uh, weeds. And then, of course, our, our urban landscapes team, which is our parks team that look after all our playgrounds. I'm going to just briefly touch on uh, some of those areas, um, but I will go into a little bit more depth in terms of development because uh, that's certainly an important economic factor driving the city at the moment and has significant impacts on the environment, the social and the cultural uh, impacts of this uh, in the local government area. So this is just a quick overview of the land use planning team. Um, you can see on the left hand side there, the areas that they look after. Um, but uh, in particular, this team looks after uh, the zoning of land and the, and the future proposals of zoning of land and the planning proposals. So uh, often the projects that they start on can take five or six years to progress and a, a planning proposal to rezone land uh, can take uh, anywhere from uh, six months to two or three years in some cases. So rezoning is a, a, a complex area, requires uh, quite a bit of consultation with both the uh, government organisations and the community, and uh, it, it can take um, quite a bit of time to get through. Um, some of the other interesting areas that land use planning look after are the heritage management. They look at the uh, administering our heritage grants and also look at what items should be listed for heritage and what items should not. And the other thing, uh, another interesting thing they look after is street naming. Um, with, with considerable development in the local government area, we're always looking for new ideas about what we should, how we should name our streets and uh, um, lots of nice uh, themes and suggestions can come in from the community and um, from the developers that we deal with. Thanks, Peter. So just to let you know, there's a, a development has a number of pathways, but if ever you get asked the question, do I need a development application for this? The answer is always yes. And then you say, then you can say, but there are certain circumstances where you're exempted from that requirement. And that's basically what the legislation says. Every, Everything requires development consent, but there are different ways that you can uh, be exempted from that. On the right-hand side of the top there, you can see development applications. That's the normal way that an application would, would come into council and be dealt with. But there's also a number of smaller types of development that are classed as exempt development. Um, so exempt development is listed in a state environmental planning policy. And basically it says, if you meet certain criteria for this sort of development, you don't need to apply for a development application. For instance, that might be, if you wanna put a garden shed in your backyard, you don't need to get development consent. One, if it's in your backyard. Two, if it's, not, uh, if it's more than a metre from the boundary. And three, if it's not more than 2.4 metres high and has an area less than um, 10 square metres. And if that's the case, you look at that and then you don't need a development application. So that's exempt development. And there's quite an extensive list of development and, and it's intentional because it wants to avoid people having to put in development applications for things like television aerials and small decks and dog kennels and uh, a whole range of things that we really don't need to see from a development point of view. The next step up from that is a simplified form of development application called complying development. 
And the difference with complying development is that it's still an application and it's still in fact classed as a development application, but it can be dealt with by either council or by a private certifier. Now, complying development basically is a type of development where you go through a checklist. And if you meet all the conditions on that checklist, then it can be done as complying development. And that's what allows private certifiers to do that. There's no discretion in it. So it's just a matter of, you must meet this criteria. And if you meet this, this criteria, you can do it as complying development. The advantage of that is that it's a much quicker process. And it all, it's also a, um, a process that can be applied to simpler development. For instance, you can actually build a, a dwelling as complying development, but it must be on, for instance, a flat block. It needs to have certain setbacks from the front and side. It can only be a single story. Um, you must have a certain area at, in the backyard for um, open space, that sort of thing. But if you meet all those criteria, complying development, a much, much quicker version of development applications. And then there are a couple of other special types of development. Sometimes uh, you can have development without consent. Now that doesn't mean you don't need to get approval. It just means that you get approval in a different way under a different section of the Act. And it's normally reserved for um, government and Crown authorities. So development without consent allows you to not go through the development application process, but you have to produce a document called a review of environmental factors, where you look at what the environmental impacts of that particular development are. But it's normally work that's done for and on behalf of council. And it includes things like um, uh, minor development at schools, uh, road works, um, uh, all our infrastructure type works, telecommunications towers, all those things that would generally be uh, government infrastructure, if you like. Thanks, Peter. Um, there's a hierarchy of legislation in the planning area. So the principal document is the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. Um, it details all the powers that local government, in fact, state government have in relation to uh, planning. Uh, sitting underneath that are the regulations. The regulations provide the detail, if you like, of, of how the um, environmental legislation is put into place. Uh, and they do that mainly because regulations are easier to um, amend than a, a, a full act. So if you want to change something in a regulation, it's a much simpler process. Sitting under the regulations are environmental planning instruments. Um, the major ones there are state environmental planning policies. So these are policies that are put out by the state government. They generally, they, they can apply to specific areas, but generally they apply to uh, right across New South Wales. They can cover a lot of different things. Examples include, there's one on how you do assessment of contaminated land. The uh, types of applications that are exempt development are included in a state environmental planning policy. There's a special state environmental planning policy for infrastructure, a special one for education establishments. Um, so the special policies that apply to particular areas that the New South Wales government produces, sitting underneath those are the local environmental plans. Now the local environmental plans are the zoning plans for each council. They're made up of two parts, usually a zoning map. Uh, we saw one of those earlier that so tells you what zone each area is, is zoned for in the local government area. It's usually a coloured map. And Attached to that are the written components of the local environmental plan as well, and that gives you the explanation of what the maps are talking about. Mike, you, you might mention that those those zones are actually and the uses are, are preset by the government as well. Yeah, so all, all the most local environmental plans are based on a, a standard local environmental plan. So all the clauses are generally uh, the same right across the state. The zones are all the same right across the state. You can get um, local variations, but uh, the more local variations you have, the more complex it is to try and get that uh, application through. They, they moved to that probably 10 years ago when they found that, you know, uh, people were going, uh, developers were going from one jurisdiction to another 
and finding completely different sets of rules. So they introduced this standard local environmental template, if you like, that all local governments uh, now use and uh, the, the zonings mean the same thing right across the state. The sitting underneath the local environmental plans, sorry, I should say, you can have several local environmental plans applying to different areas. So following uh, the merger of, of uh, Pellerine and Queensland City Councils, we actually had seven different local environmental plans in place. And we, over that five or six years since that time, we've been through the process of consolidating those multiple plans into one. We call it the Comprehensive Local Environmental Plan. That's basically been adopted by council and it's uh, with the state government at the moment, uh, awaiting its final gazette. Um, and sitting underneath the local environment plans are development control plans. And these are the detail about how you implement your local environmental plan. They can apply to particular areas, they can apply to particular topics. For instance, there might be a section in the development control plan on car parking. There might be one on how we uh, design multi-unit development. Um, but there might, might also be one that protects the character of, uh, say, Braidwood. Braidwood has a specific development control plan that looks after its uh, heritage character. And uh, so it's much more detailed. It specifies uh, different controls so that people who are looking to do development have got something to go to. The big, big difference between a local environment plan and development control plan is that uh, it's much harder to, um, you, just... to, to vary the requirements of a local environmental plan, whereas council yeah, can good. really prepares the development control plan and we can consider variations to the requirements in there based on the merits of a situation. Thanks, Peter. Do you have a question? Uh, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mike. Where would we find a list of all the development control plans that are currently um, in force in the LGA? Okay, so um, on the on the website under the planning area, there's a section there called planning controls. When you go into there, it has a listing of all of the local environmental plans, the development control plans, and the contribution plans. And it lists all of those and you can get direct access to those from there. Can I ask another question? One thing that's come up in talking to people in Braidwood is the impact of the heavy vehicles from the mine and logging operations, uh, particularly on the main street. And there, there would be some kind of agreement, I think, between the council and the um, uh, those road users about their, the amount of money they contribute towards maintenance costs for the roads. Where would we find that? Uh, that's in the uh, voluntary planning agreement with uh, Darg's mine. That should also be on the on the website on the site. But if it's not, uh, let me know and we can. Uh, it is a public document and it does indicate the different contributions they need to make for that. Yes, Phil. Yeah, Mike. Can if I, I just, can add to just um, to that. Well, just I'm on the Triple C committee at the Darg's mine. And the, the mines website itself has all its documentation there, um, and they were telling me quite recently that they they they, they put in a hundred thousand dollars a year to assist with the maintenance, basically of Majors Creek Road. But I'm, I'm not sure um, how that's spent. Uh, I think it's uh, basically given as a lump sum to council. I, I stand corrected if that's the okay, case. So, um, yeah, and just you a, decide a, where we'll, it needs we'll to be spent. We'll ask, we'll ask Phil to answer. I think it's about ninety-four thousand, Phil. Yep, that's right. So, so I guess just to clarify a couple of things, when a particular development like Darg's Reef comes up, we will um, we will often require them to pay a contribution to um, a, a particular road, which is often the whole route that they will haul their material over. And in this in this case, it's um, a section of the Majors Creek Road. They pay the ninety four thousand dollars for the um, for the uh, for the ongoing maintenance of that road, uh, just to I guess keep that in perspective. We just spent uh, nearly five hundred thousand dollars fixing up one one and a half or two kilometres of that road. Um, you know, so we certainly don't get all the money to fix up the road from that that particular developer. But Katrina, you mentioned the main street of Braidwood. I need to be clear that the Dargs Reef don't pay for the main street of Braidwood. They're not required to pay for the main street of Braidwood, and their trucks can drive up there. But note too that it is a state road 
In fact, it's a highway. And in fact, any truck can go up there and, uh, and nobody pays for the damage that that gets caused um, as they travel up, up through there. The repairs on that road are funded from Transport from New South Wales. Thanks for that, Phil. We might, we, we might add, Phil, that uh, just while well, you mentioned Braidwood, we are working with Transport for New South Wales at, at the completion of uh, certainly the Clyde works that we're looking for funding to go and uh, do some uh, pavement work along uh, Wallace Street through that section of Braidwood. Yeah, we've been working with them. And in fact, we're um, trying to get that, that done uh, before either one side or the other of Christmas as well. So yeah. we're certainly aware of uh, Wallace Street and we're looking to try and uh, work with Transport to get the money to fix that up. Thanks, Phil. Mike, Mike, you might keep going. So when you do lodge a development application, what happens? So generally there's a, a for more complex applications, we have a, we have a pre-lodgement discussion. We certainly encourage developers with more complex applications coming, coming to see us because um, for every application that, uh, that makes it to council, um, there's a lot of pre-consultation goes on to try and get that development to a stage where at least council staff feel that it can be considered. There's many, many uh, applications get, what would you say, probably uh, knocked out because they simply don't meet the grade even before they come to council. So there's pre-lodgement meetings, they're lodged. Now the lodgement more recently since uh, I think June last year uh, has been through what's called the e-portal. Now this is a state government initiative that allows all development applications across all of, all of the state to be lodged through one place. Um, this is now occurring and while it hasn't been integrated with our system, it does continue to provide us with some challenges, um, but it does mean now that all applications are coming in through one source. Uh, after the lodgement process, the application goes through assessment. That includes uh, in certain cases, notification to neighbours, not in every case, but there's a policy that dictates when neighbours should be advised. Uh, the neighbours uh, get an opportunity to comment on the development. It's not a consultation process, it's a notification process. Uh, neighbours get an opportunity to make comments and those comments are taken on board during the assessment. But there's not generally, a, um, it's not a backwards and forwards consultation process. Uh, the assessment process is really taking on balance the merits of the thing against uh, the proposed development against the submissions that are made and the provisions of the planning legislation and coming to a determination. A determination can be made by the staff under delegation. It can be made by the council, a council meeting, or in some cases with major developments, it's made by the state regional planning panel. That's made up of three representatives from the state government and two representatives that council appoints. After the determination, uh, you have your planning approval, but you still need to get effectively your construction certificate or your structural building approval. The big difference with the construction certificate is that it can be um, it can be issued by either the council or by a private certifier. So the old days where you had a building application that could only be approved by council no longer exists. And probably at least half the applications for construction certificates for development are now done by private certifiers. Um, there's very little in, input from council. In fact, council doesn't know that they've even been issued until the works commence and we get advised of that. Uh, after the work's completed, an occupation certificate is issued. And again, that is issued by either the council or a private certifier, depending on who the uh, applicant nominates as a person that they want to provide that service. It's a competitive service and um, council competes with the private sector for those construction certificate and inspection services. To give you a bit of an idea of the development activity, that's been happening in the local government area. Here's the activity for the last five years. The blue is development applications. The orange is complying development applications. And the gray is modification applications. So if you get approval for a development application and you wanna change your mind or change something 
with the design during the uh, period of construction, you need to get that modified and that requires another assessment and a modifications uh, application is lodged for that purpose. Um, the, it's interesting, that's the number of applications received, but it's also interesting to look at the value of the applications received. So development applications, again, are in blue, complying development are in orange. Uh, modifications don't have a value because they've already been assessed. But you can see that the, the value of the developments and um, it's quite substantial. In five years, we've uh, determined over $1.2 billion worth of development across the local government area. Um, that's significant. It's significant in terms of regional cities right throughout New South Wales. So what are those applications made up of? These are for development applications. You can see the largest majority, the orange slice there, are new dwellings. So people building new houses right across the local government area, um, principally in the, the new development areas, but also there's quite substantial new dwellings being built in the uh, rural areas, uh, rural residential areas throughout the local government area. And the blue area is the additions and alterations. So that's all types of additions and alterations relating to dwellings garages, swimming pools, alterations, extensions, uh, retaining walls, all those sorts of things that you would be ancillary to a, a dwelling are included in that blue section. So that's numbers, but let's have a look at the value. So when you look at the value of the, of the different types of applications, you can see that not surprisingly, new dwellings make up more, almost half of the value of all development that's taken place, six, nearly $600, $600 million. Um, subdivision, um, you can see we had a much smaller slice of the number of applications, but subdivision makes up a substantial um, amount of work in terms of its value. And that's principally related to the major urban release areas of Gurgong, Crowley and uh, Elmsley in Bungendore. And then in the, in the darker blue, you've got community facilities. Now that does go up and down a bit, but uh, if you have some bigger community, community facilities and we had over the, have over the last five years, they include things like the, um, like the council building next door, um, the sports hubs, um, the um, uh, extension to the indoor sports centre, uh, the private school out at Bungendore, they're all, uh, sorry, out at um, Gugong, they're all classed as community facilities and that's why there's a substantial amount there. Surprisingly, you might be surprised that there's not as much commercial and industrial development, but we don't have a great deal of that, although there is a bit of demand for industrial land coming on at the moment. Thanks, Peter. And just, uh, I just thought I'd show you this one. This just shows you the value of applications by the area of the local government area where uh, that money's being spent at the moment. So you can see almost half the value of the developments is being spent in Google at the moment. Um, another third in uh, Queenie, uh, some in Bangandore and Braidwood, and uh, you can see quite a significant area there in the rural balance. Um, and we, that, that includes all those rural residential areas. There's quite a bit of development there. I, I should let you know that it's, that type of development is much more complex than the same sort of development in, say, Google. It's much harder to get... A, 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 it's it's counterintuitive, I suppose, that it's harder to actually get an approval for a dwelling on a large property out in the, in the country than it is to get a development in Google. And that's because of the uh, large number of constraints that have been introduced over the last 25 years that relate to things like biodiversity, land clearing, um, bushfire, um, and uh, soil and water erosion control. Those constraints or those controls have made rural development much more complex than it used to be. So how are the applications determined? 
So 90%, 97% of the, all the applications are actually determined by staff. Um, we save up the more complex ones and the tricky ones for council. Council looks after about 2% of those and the regional planning panel usually does less than 1%. So those figures that you can see there, uh, they're a, a, a spread over five years to give you a bit of an idea. So where are the bigger developments in the city uh, that are taking up our time and effort? Gugong Township, of course, is the most significant one. Um, it's a 25-year project that commenced back in 2012. So going for another, uh, we're about, I suppose, a third of the way through, nearly halfway through. It's going to have 6,500 lots, 17,000 people, a major shopping area, high school and primary school. And it's one of the uh, major areas that the state government included in, the, in their um, regional housing strategies, if you like, they said that we needed to build 10,000 homes here over the next 25 years. And this is one of the, the bigger areas that, where that's happening. Kitty, you had a question? Yes, thanks for that. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, uh, um, Peter, you referred to losing a few people in the DA space and that sort of had an impact on throughput in terms of processing for DAs. Are there SLAs that have been set um, in terms of the time to respond or you know get those approvals yeah, through or we meet them the, the, there are there are benchmarks that are set set by DPI um, and but there are processes that call stop the clock so as a, as a DA is lodged and I was going to mention Mike that uh, with that e planning portal produced by the government a lot of people who might go online register their application but it can take a number of weeks before it's formally lodged depending on receipt of all appropriate information and, and fees, for example. But a lot of people think I lodged it on Monday and two weeks later, it's actually it's actually really lodged because they haven't paid their fees or whatever the case may be. But there are not the normal 40 days, uh, working day statutory period, but there's a stop a clock arrangement that, that takes place pending on the receipt of information or indeed, if they are required for referrals or concurrence of state agencies, each of which can then take 28 days. So Mike, you, anything to add? Do you so, have yeah. that's on, on how many you're are meeting the 40 days in terms of if everybody's submitted yep. what they need to, we, we can get access to it? So, um, so we're, we're not meeting that requirement at the moment. We're not getting, in general, the majority of applications out in 40 days. Um, what, what happens, the 40 days is, is not so much uh, a time frame within which you must approve the applications. What happens after 40 days is that it enables the applicant to launch an appeal against the application not having been determined. Now that has happened very rarely because usually council is working towards getting a determination and you don't really want to take a matter to court, but it has happened on occasion. But in most of those cases, the application has been outstanding for, for more than 12 months. Uh, it certainly would be unusual to do that for a house or something like that. Mm. Okay, thanks for that. Sure, thank you. So just, um, oh, sorry. That's no, keep going, thanks Peter. Yep. So I just, uh, there's a bit of an overlay there. That shows you the area of Dugong that's actually been completed to date. Um, the area on the left-hand side, neighbourhood uh, two is, is being built at the moment. And at the bottom, you can see neighbourhoods three, four, and five. We have the development application in with council presently at this time. And we're assessing that. That'll probably be determined sometime next year. So to date, there's approximately 2,700 homes out there. They've been all built since 2014. There's 4,500 people, a neighbourhood shopping centre, a private uh, K-12 school. Three playing fields have been finished. It's got tennis courts and netball courts. But there will be some additional, considerable number of additional facilities built before it's finished. Katrina. Yeah, th thanks very much. Um, I, I've been leafleting, like everyone else probably on this call, um, and I couldn't help but notice the paucity of um, solar panels on the roofs or solar hot water uh, systems on the roofs of the houses at Gugong. And I'm mystified how any huge development like of this scale that we've just been told about um, could proceed without some kind of requirement. Now, in the past, I've been told councils can't do it, but other councils do it. 
And um, I would be horrified if the rest of Gugong were going to be um, developed without a requirement to do a bit more on energy, uh, renewable energy. So I'm interested in what development control plan applies to all this housing DA that's coming through and whether there is a sco the scope to improve um, renewable energy for the remainder of the Gugong Township. Well, that's a workshop in itself, Katrina, but um, I'm not sure I can add anything than what you already know. Uh, Council's position is that energy efficiency for every dwelling is controlled by a basic certificate that you have to get before you uh, can lodge your application. That's a New South Wales state government requirement, and that sets the benchmark for energy efficiency in those homes. It's then a matter for the for the applicant whether or not they want to incorporate solar energy or solar. So I, I can only reiterate that it is not a council requirement, nor is council uh, able to enforce it. So it can't use the DCPs because I've no. been told that's what other councils do. Count other councils may do that, but uh, it cannot be enforced. James, were you coming on to ask a question? No. Okay. We need we, we we need to take the state we need the state government to take the lead in that and to mandate what people have to do in terms of um, energy efficiency in their homes. It's it's silly to have different requirements in different councils. It should be a requirement right across the state, and it should require. I I agree with you totally. It should require solar solar um, electricity. It should require hot water particularly for new homes where you can actually recover the cost of those over the life of the project. It's a no-brainer. James, you had a further question? Can't hear you for some reason, James. We can see you moving, but no voice. Try that again. No, can't hear you, sorry. You might want to put your comment into the chat line and uh, we, we can get uh, that brought up if there's any help. All right. Thank Mike, we might. Next one, thank you. Yep. Hello. Oh, no, I'm here you. now, yes. <laughs> okay, I just said, uh, yeah, look. Um, when you, a lot of people, when they're building, just on the, of course, solar and, you know, that's great. Um, I agree. But, uh, you know, I've built a couple of energy efficient houses and when you, you know, these sort of, uh, options, if you like, uh, you, you've got to decide. Can I do I want double glazing or solar roof? Now I put a solar panel on my roof when I could afford it, and a lot of subsidies seem to be taken up be by you know electric cars and and solar and so on by people who've actually got money. So when people are struggling to get into the market, these become sort of optional extras. You know, um, do I want? Uh, you know, a pergola or, or a, a solar. It's not so easy, I don't think. If you're going to build in those costs, I don't know. It's, it's, it's. Um, I'm sure people would do it. It, it is absolutely a no-brainer. And anyone who's done anything that's environmentally, building-wise, um, sensible knows that it's a better way to live. But it does often come at a cost. So I agree that there should be energy. Um, I mean, design is simple, but technology like that does have a cost. That's my point. Yeah, as Mike, said, as Mike said, it will be a workshop on itself. Yeah, it is a work, it's a whole workshop topic, that one. Yes. Just to run through to give you an idea of how the development takes place. So this is Gugong as a green field. This is how it, and just run through those 2014, 2016, 2019, and last month. So um, that's just an example of how, how quickly a, a new greenfields development can actually happen. Um, and uh, all that land you can see there on, on being developed on the left-hand side there, they have, have uh, sold most of that land as well. So there's a big demand at the moment for uh, residential development at the moment. Thanks, Peter. Uh, another significant development we have is uh, South Jerobombra. It's located in Tralee. Uh, to the uh, south west of, of uh, Queenbian and Jerobombra. That's uh, on the left-hand side. You can see 
the Hume Industrial Area, the railway line running between the two areas, so ACT on one side, New South Wales on the other. Uh, Tralee or South Jarabombra will eventually have 1,500 homes, um, and uh, that's constrained by the ability of the intersections, road intersections in the area to cope with the development. So uh, there could be more development in those areas, but at the moment, the roads can't cope with that and there would need to be some sort of additional road design to cope with that. That development's planned over the next 15 years. And uh, again, they're progressing uh, with good sales at that location. This is the uh, innovation precinct. So this is just north of the South Jerobomba urban release area. Um, on the right hand side, you've got established Jerobomba. On the left hand side, the railway line. And uh, coming in from the top of the picture, you've got Thompson Drive. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the area, that just above where Peter's pointing there, that's the new McDonald's, KFC, Aldi, and service station. We're showing you this picture because it involves the Ed, uh, Elton, sorry, in Verona. in Verona Drive, or as we call it, the Northern Entry Road. Uh, and this provides the access down to the South Jerobomba Urban Release Area. But what it does is it has, it's, it's opened up the land on either side of this area for further development as well. Thanks, Peter. And this is what will be happening in this area. And uh, this land's been basically rezoned to allow this to happen. So on either side, as you're coming from the north down the street, you've got a Poplar's Technology Park or a business park. Uh, council, that's in the light green. Uh, council has uh, acquired a site here as the Innovation Hub. That's been uh, granted to us by the developers. The new Jerobombra High School will be in that location there. It's got a link through to the primary school to the, to the east there. There'll be a link through to there. Uh, in the purple there, we've got a new industrial park that uh, Village Building Company is building, about 50 industrial properties in there. And then in the pink to the left of that, you've got the new regional sports facility, which I'll mention a little bit later about what's there. To the north of that, there's a uh, uh, investigation going on about establishing a, a, a rail intermodal uh, using the existing railway line there. Um, and a large part of that poplars area is covered by uh, grassland, natural grassland reserves, both on that side and on the northern side of Thompson Drive. Thanks, Peter. At Bungendore, um, there's also quite a bit of demand for residential development. At the moment, we're looking at uh, North Bungendore or Elm Grove, it's called. That's what they're calling the estate name. Uh, we've presently approved about uh, 100 lots in there and that's under construction. And we do have a development application for the remaining 200 lots in that, that particular area. There'll be about 300 there altogether. To the, to the south of that, we've got Bungendore East. Now, Bangalore, that's not quite as progressed. It's going through the rezoning process at the moment. It's got to the stage where it's at public exhibition, so it's about two-thirds of the way through the process. Um, and there'll be about 600 lots in that area. There's also a bit of infill around, um, uh, around uh, Bangalore. Uh, some of the larger blocks in towards the town centre have the capability of being subdivided and it's not uncommon to see a subdivision there of maybe eight to 15 lots as infill. Um, just a little bit about how, how well, let me start again. These large developments generate a lot of demand for community facilities. And because of that, they need to make a contribution to those facilities. Now, those facilities can be within the development themselves, but of course they also have impacts on um, community facilities outside of their development area and things like roads. You know, the, you, build, you build a subdivision that's got six and a half thousand people, then it's gonna naturally have an impact on roads right throughout the, uh, the city or village that you happen to be in. So the legislation provides that council can collect 
what we call developer contributions from those developers to contribute towards the cost of providing those facilities. They can be things like open space embellishment, uh, parks and playgrounds, for instance, community facilities, physical buildings where uh, local people can meet, road upgrades, car parking, water and sewage supply, and the administration of the planning. Um, for a new development area, you, you can get up to $20,000 per block, and with special requirements, you can get up to $30,000 per block. That money is paid to council under a what's called a 7-Eleven plan, and that 7-Eleven plan is quite detailed in how much money can be collected and what that money is going to be used for. And that's all the money can, that can be used for that you collect for that particular purpose. So that, they're, called, they're called Section 94 plans. That was the old, old term. They're now called Section 711 plans or developer contribution plans. And for water and sewer, they're called the Section 64 plan. It's just that those, those funds are generally generated by new subdivisions, multi-unit development, and new development on, on rural land. So that's a way that council can acquire um, funds to provide facilities, future facilities um, uh, for the new developments and for existing developments as well. They, for instance, they can make a contribution to libraries or something like that, or to the, to the queue. There is another way though uh, to uh, make arrangements for these facilities provided, and that's through a voluntary planning agreement. But this is an agreement between the council and the developer about what they will provide on site. Um, we have three of these at the moment, one at Google, one at South Jerobombra, and one at Jumping Creek, which has not been approved at this stage. Um, and they make, a, they're a special arrangement where the developer says that they'll provide these facilities and council agrees with whether or not. Now, normally the council is much better off. We get a much better, much higher number of facilities or a much better grade of facilities than we would be able to build with our own money. They're also built much more quickly and they're usually provided by the developer as uh, in-kind works. So they're usually produced as part of the development itself. And um, there's various reasons why a developer might want to do this. For instance, at Gugon, um, they do it to create a particular market that they're aiming towards, selling their houses through out there. So generally the facilities at things like playgrounds and the amenities buildings at their open spaces are of a higher quality than you would normally expect to see in a standard subdivision. But that's an example of where uh, a voluntary planning agreement can, uh, can work. Another example is a Jumping Creek. In that voluntary planning agreement, they're going to have to spend something like $1.5 million in rehabilitating some of the land so that when it comes across the council, we've got, it, it's, it's been um, decontaminated and uh, rehabilitated. So uh, that's been tied up in a voluntary planning agreement. Those sorts of things are very difficult to tie up with a developer contribution plan. I just wanted to move on to our urban landscapes team now and talk about some of the, some of the issues that they look after. Um, so, uh, 12 cemeteries, 32 sporting fields, multiple facilities and amenities throughout the local government area, and 76 playgrounds, um, and plus all the, all the um, associated gardens in our villages and CBDs that they look after. Some of the big projects that our urban landscapes team are involved in at the moment are the, Bung the, the Braidwood Skate Park. That's just out for tender. In fact, we've got the tender ready to come in for that one. The Bungendore Sports Hub, the earthworks for the sports hub have been completed and they're just laying down the first two turf fields and the first couple of netball courts. And uh, we're hoping that they'll be ready for next season, although we do have to build the road to get in and the amenities building um, uh, to service those particular functions. But we may be able to provide some temporary facilities in there until the permanent ones are built. Um, the uh, New Bungendore Playground, that's a $900,000 project. That's at McShirt Oval. That's been, we're working on with a local community group there. And uh, 
the tender for that's been let and that'll be happening next year as well. Uh, Frogs Hollow at Bungendor. Um, Council's agreed to do some embellishment at Frogs Hollow. We're just seeking funding for that. And uh, when that funding's available, we'll work on that. And uh, we've also got the regional sports complex in Queanbeyan. Uh, it's a stage development, but uh, it's a, a major, a major sports complex, basically to provide a second tier to things like the AIS uh, and uh, where we can hold state and regional competitions. It'll involve two synthetic hockey fields uh, in the blue, a synthetic soccer field and a turf soccer field, um, uh, two additional soccer fields and some training fields up to the north, and uh, new, new amenities, park, car parking, and the second stages of the project include an indoor sports facility for four basketball courts and other indoor activities and a regional aquatic centre. Um, so quite a bit of uh, time and money uh, tied up there and we're still looking for additional funding grant funding to run that project. Another public domain project in Queen is the uh, proposed botanic gardens, which basically run from the Lone Level Bridge down to the railway bridge section of the river and take in either side of the river. That's a long-term project. It's very early stages and we're just developing some uh, designs for how that might progress in the future. It'll be significant funding and it takes time to develop that. The last group that I uh, wanted to talk about was our natural landscapes and health team. Primarily a regulatory team. They, they, this is the team that does the food shop inspections, looks after all the uh, pollution control incidents, um, looks after catchment management and all the biosecurity weeds issues. Um, uh, they're a, a graph there of a couple of things that they, you, you might be looking at, the number of um, pollution incidents that we have faced over the last couple of years. The team also looks after um, uh, sampling of the river, the Queenbin River, and uh, reports on uh, the quality of that in terms of its recreational purposes. So uh, that's something that that team looks after. And I think, Peter, that might just about wrap my team up. Thanks, Mike. Any closing questions for Mike? Yes, Katrina. Thanks, Mike. Can you explain the source of the source of the high phosphorus? readings if that if i was reading that report card right is that possible no, yeah no uh, I, I can't explain the source i can say that it has always been an issue um uh in in the queen river it's usually an area that you know where we're not getting great results and i think uh i think phil it's all even been a, an issue for us in our um in our sewage outlet not that that affects this at all because the sewage outlet is further down but I suspect it's probably to do with what's happening upstream in both the agricultural areas and uh, the development areas, Katrina. Yeah, fertiliser. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Um, we uh, Thanks, Mike, for that. Uh, and yeah, Jack, we might head on to your area next. Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to talk about some of the things we at Community Choice do with the, in the community and with the community. And as the name suggests, we have a very direct involvement. Um, I won't be talking today about customer service, communication, uh, internal and external, or records, which also falls into this portfolio, but I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. So events, events is a large part of what we do and a very popular part of what we do. Um, and they really come in, in three sorts. So we have our civic events, uh, citizenship ceremonies, we have a big one of those happening tomorrow, Australia Day events. And this team also looks after the sister cities relationship in terms of um, when we have delegations come out here, we would prepare their program. As you would imagine, that hasn't been very particularly busy in the past couple of years. But sister city is uh, with Myanmar Alps in Japan and also with Okrid, that's a friendship city in Macedonia. So other than the civic uh, events, we have the larger scale economic events. Um, 
and Peter, you're circling the bit, but I'm not up to there yet. So the, uh, the, they're the ones that we've been very successful in attracting over the border from Canberra. So you may be aware that Oktoberfest has been with us for about the last four years. Um, last year, we, Good Folk, the National Folk Festival came to Queanbeyan, and we're attracting a lot of the um, larger car events and so on. So that's in, about in, increasing the, um, the importance of this area as a destination for visitors and so on. Uh, we also have community events and they come in two types. So one is the multicultural festival, which you can see there with the streamers. And the other is our very popular music by, by the river. And that's a, event, an event, a free community event that we do in conjunction with Icon Water um, that happens around March each year. So they're council run events and there are other things that we do, the smaller ones like Bang the Door um, that was held in, um, in Bungendore. We also do smaller community events like the community Christmas parties um, and um, those sorts of things. But um, or we have community led events, which is where the community wants to put on event an event and they're, uh, they're pretty much doing it. Uh, examples of that were Meet the Makers in Bungendore um, and airing of the quilts in both Bungendore and Braidwood and the Majors Creek Music Festival. So, so our events team would assist and would do some of the things that um, the community might find difficult, like preparing their traffic plans or uh, doing supporting them with extra marketing and so on. And uh, there is an events budget, so decisions would be brought to council about whether those events would be supported by actual cash rather than just in kind. So great range of events. We've attracted many awards over the last few years. Oh, you've got a different order to me, Peter. Oh, have I? Yeah. So I had the Q Art, um, Arts and Culture next. Doesn't matter. Uh -huh. We'll go on to economic development. Mike talked about the transformation of the master plan I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but Mike talked about the innovation precinct in South Jera, and that has been named um, as a regional jobs precinct by the New South Wales government. There are only four of these precincts across New South Wales, and um, that's about um, attracting various industries of the future there, the ones that are going to endure. And you can see there on, on number six to ten in that um, industries there. So freight and logistics is becoming very important with um, more shopping online, more purchasing and so on. Defence, high high tech industries and so on, and renewable energy. So it, this precinct is about attracting some of those long term industries and therefore long term jobs to that area. As I said, we're only one of four named in um, New South Wales. Uh, regional development, New South Wales government funded a regional economic development strategy. Um, and what they were talking, what they did right across New South Wales was divide the state up into regional uh, functional economic regions. Fortunately, our LGA was seen as a functional economic region on its own. So our strategy was just for Queen Bee and Palarang. And that talked about what are our natural endowments and how we should be moving forward in the future in terms of jobs, industry, and so on. So very much connected to some of the things we're doing. It's Somebody got a question? No? Okay, um, smart city stuff. That's uh, about smart lighting, smart parking. It's about connectivity. Um, we have, there are some problems with connectivity in the Eastern side of the region. We're always looking at how we can improve that through smart city stuff and grants and so on that are given to us by government. We also, this area also looks after grants. So if you've been dabbling around on the website, you'll see what we call Grants Guru. So you can go into that um, program and put in any sort of thing that you might want to find a grant for, and it will automatically um, spit out to you all the possibilities that are, of grants that are open at the moment. Um, so that, that was just established last year. It's a pretty good program, open to the community as well. Because of the last couple of years, disaster recovery has been really important, um, particularly when the... Um, no, I'm still on the same page, Peter. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, there, um, this is just the economic um, part of disaster recovery. With the Kings Highway closed, it ruined a lot of the businesses from Bungendore and Braidwood in particular. So we've had to look at um, giving small grants. So this was government, New South Wales government funded, small grants to businesses to help them survive. Sometimes it was um, getting them to understand marketing, uh, especially social media and online marketing better. It was sometimes to capture databases, anything they felt they needed. They applied for one of these small grants and um, got some assistance in that way. We assisted them a lot more, which I'll talk about in a minute. Also, the development of two websites, Invest Queenbean Palarang and Live Queenbean Palarang. And they're for people who might want to, businesses who might want to move their business to the area. It shows them all of the opportunities that are available to them. And the same if you want to move to the area and live here as a resident, what sort of things we've got going on, how to get acquainted, a new residence guide, and so on and so forth. Um, this area also looks after. Uh, businesses, so the Braidwood sale yards and truck wash. We're still back, Peter, sorry. Um, the Riverside Cafe and the Riverside um, Caravan Park. It all, we also support the uh, Bungendore Chamber of Commerce and the industry and, industry and the Braidwood Villages Business Chamber, which is newly forming. And any liaison for business uh, inquiries goes through that team. Okay, thanks, Peter. I'm going to wait. No, no, we're ready now. Sorry, I do rave on. The master plan, this is a refresh of the CBD spatial master plan, and that occurred in 2019. And you can see that the, uh, the plan divides um, the Queen Bean CBD into eight basic, basic precincts, uh, sorry, six basic precincts that, um, that the city can do particular things in each precinct. It's a way forward for, and out of this has come eight stages of um, development and projects um, that will occur over a long period of time. So the two ones that are occurring at the moment is the uh, Queen Bean Civic and Cultural Precinct, where the uh, new offices will be, and also the Monero Street upgrade. So they're the first two projects projects from the master plan. This group also did the Queen Bean place plan that came out in 2020. And that's about how we activate the various spaces across the city. Um, how do we make people want to be there? How do we uh, enhance our nighttime economy and so on? How do we lift um, the city? The Monero laneways project uh, which is related to the place plan is about taking some laneways, specifically Blacksmith Lane and No Name Lane, which are currently just kind of brick walkways and making them something quite special. So that's happening at the moment. And this team looked at the business engagement and ran workshops for the Monero Street upgrade, not obviously managing the project itself, but looking at how, what people feel about it. Uh, what would that they would like to see in this upgrade. Also the shop and win, that's a, a place um, initiative. This happens in Bungenbore and Braidwood each year and it's supported by um, Bendigo Bank. It's about encouraging people to shop in the villages in the eastern side of the LGA to go to Bungendore and buy stuff and uh, Braidwood and buy their Christmas presents and so on. It's run every year around Christmas time for the last three years. And you can go into a draw. For every $20 you spend, you go into a draw to win. I think it's $1,000 or I'm, I'm not quite sure. But it's then again, you need to spend that shopping, spend that money within the LGA. The Christmas decorations project, this is where we decorate the whole LGA and that's uh, very much a place initiative and also again business liaison. Tourism um, became quite important um, after the bushfires because, as I said, these uh, Bungendore and Brave within the surrounds were really suffering. <laughs> So the, um, the business and innovation team got together with some local um, local um, public PR agencies and developed the first um, tourism project that we've had in the region. And this was called the Treasure Trail. And it was about the fact that we understand people are driving through 
to um, the south coast, but why not dig a little deeper, stay a little, lo a little longer and find the real treasures we have in this region. This was a highly successful campaign. And uh, as a result, we've won two tourism awards for this particular campaign. One was a local government award and one was an economic development award. And the service manager in this area has won the Peter Chaffley Award for Economic Development Leadership. And that's just happened this year. Um, so off the back of this campaign, the tourism team are uh, further developing campaigns for, for us autumn, spring and summer next year to get people to visit the region and really explore it. Um, at the same time, we, we are part, I'm not quite off that page yet, Peter, the same time we are part of the Tablelands Destination and Marketing Plan. So that's, that's an initiative with a lot of surrounding councils to see what we have what we can have offer as a kind of a trail, a joint um, initiative between us all rather than acting individually. Next. Okay, libraries. Um, so we, as you would know, we have libraries in Bungendore, Braidwood and Queanbeyan, but the library delivers a lot more than just a library. They're the centre for many people in our community. Uh, a lot of our homeless people um, spend a lot of time in the library. Uh, we have a lot of school kids come and do their homework there and so on. Um, and for those areas that we can't can't actually get into the library we have a couple of, of initiatives one is the mobile library so that's a van that was uh, grant funded it's fitted out with a whole lot of uh, possibilities um, for people to borrow and that goes around to the more remote areas and the community has various communities have often latched onto that and put on morning teas and so on and made it quite a social occasion when the library comes out. We also have a home library and that's a delivery service for people who can't get out. They're shut in for, for whatever reason, they might be elderly or they might be infirm. And that could be a long-term thing or just a short-term thing if people are sick for a little while. So we will take the library to them. Now, during COVID, when the library couldn't be open, we had to, we wanted to continue that service. And so we had our click and collect service. So you could order your books or CDs or DVDs online and pick them up at the Braidwood Library or the Queen Bin Library. And we had a click and deliver for people of Bungendore and surrounds because the library there was is inside the school, part of the school library, and that wasn't open at the time. So we're continuing some of those services because they've been so very popular with the community. In addition, we have children's services, story time, baby bounce, toddler time, and an online uh, little bang discovery on demand. That's a scientific workshop for kids that uh, you can do online. A lot of those things went online during COVID so people could entertain their kids uh, while they were still shut in. And some of our tech services at the library are very popular with our senior citizens. So they can go and do a class on, on technology, how to navigate their computer, how to work a phone and so on and so forth. You can actually book a librarian if you want some one-on-one -on -one advice. We run movie clubs and book clubs both online and in person. And there are lots of author events where an author will come and talk about their book. Um, and again, this has been online during COVID, but in person for um, most of the time. Thanks, Peter. Our community services uh, are very important. Some of the key things we do are family daycare. Um, that's a highly valued service. I'm sure you all know what that is. It's where children, instead of going to a a daycare will go into an educator's home. These people have to be, they're often mums or grandmas or whatever, they have to be trained and they have to be evaluated by our family daycare staff. And so they might take up to four children at a time. So it's more one-on-one -on -one, um, care. Uh, council runs that service. We are also looking into updating our reconciliation action plan 
and our disability inclusion action plan. Both of those things are happening at the moment. They're both mandated uh, plans. And it's looking at how we as a council can be more inclusive um, and also how we, as, how we can offer our community services more readily to people with disability or to our Indigenous people across the LGA. As I'm sure you would have heard, recently our youth services and our indoor sports centre was passed to the PCYC, a brand new Queanbeyan uh, PCYC. The good thing, uh, the decision was hard to take. Council um, made this decision because of the extended services that could be offered by a PCYC that we as a council could never hope to provide. Um, it's just far too expensive. So they offer, in addition to their community programs of sporting hire and facility hire and so on, they offer lots of programs for youth at risk. They offer seniors programs, kids programs, school programs. And the great thing is they can offer these programs right across the LGA. So whilst they're established at the Indoor Sports Centre in Queanbeyan, they do run programs in the wider LGA and, and or will collect kids from these places, bring them into Queanbeyan to take part in this program. So it's a, an initiative that people have wanted in Queanbeyan for some time. And we're really delighted to be able to open that last Thursday. All the hands up there are about our new volunteering uh, program. We're looking at how we can get volunteers back on board after COVID. So it's a great way to connect the community with council and to connect to the community with other services. Um, and that'll, that'll be happening. We're looking at the moment for opportunities um, to do so and friends of the library, friends of Ruston House, certainly we have ushers at the queue and these are all great ways of the community meeting different people and also great ways of council um, getting some, being able to offer an extra layer of service. Even, uh, not yet Peter, even though we have passed on our um, youth services largely to PCYC, we do have retained our youth committee and they, through grant funding and other means, still do um, events and other things targeted at youth. We've had one this week. It's a, an art project on Moor Park. They, are, they have an artist who has um, designed a mural, thrown it up on the side of the shipping container there, and the youth will be painting it almost like paint by numbers. So they'll be painting that artist mural. So they've, they've had some training and some activity this week on that, on that. Seniors programs, we do an annual trivia competition. We provide a senior center at the old uh, visitor information center at the back of that. And we also run programs in seniors week um, and um, they get in, included in a lot of our events and so on. And finally, the, the nature of community development has evolved. So rather than specifying each year what services we run, we talk to the community about what the specific needs might be at any particular time. So a couple of years ago, you might have heard about our storybook cafe. That was because we noted there was a high rate of youth unemployment and we combined with a, um, a coffee company to train our um, youth who are interested in hospitality and in becoming baristas and how to how to be how to use customer service and so on and I think we got from that program around 40 kids went from being unemployed to having jobs here in Queanbeyan so that was a highly successful program it also won both a New South Wales and a national award for a community project okay thank you Recovering resilience, this is a new area to my portfolio and clearly it came as a result of the 2019-2020 bushfires. Um, the region was devastated in many ways, perhaps not as badly as some other LGAs, but we had a lot of suffering people um, in our surrounding districts, our smaller villages and so on. And so the New South Government has funded uh, a large portion of this program. It's for a uh, bushfire recovery officer, 
a farm gate support, so somebody who goes directly to the more remote people in the LGA to talk to them, to find out how they are, and admin support. Initially, this was all about um, at, at matching people with services because we found a lot of people who were eligible for government support didn't know how to access it. So a lot of the early work was about helping people do that. Um, since then, it's about keeping the community connected with community meetings and events. It's about bringing the services to people. Those services still exist. It's about providing food um, during COVID for people who could not get out to shop. And uh, our kind, COVID kindness project, which is loosely linked to this one, that happened when COVID uh, first hit. And it was about, if you need anything, call the central number and we will get a service to you. The ongoing work of the Recovery and Resilience um, Hub, which is located in Braidwood, is about community recovery and resilience. So you can see there that, um, that graphic that talks about the four stages of emergency response. So being prepared, responding to the emergency as it happens, recovering, and then thinking about what have we learned and how can we mitigate, how do we build back better, how do we mitigate some of the things that um, exacerbated the emergency in the first place. So a, a lot of the work that is happening now is about that mitigation and preparedness um, the, the stuff. And all of our small communities are slowly putting together their resilience plans. Okay, thank you, Peter. Um, sorry, sorry, Bill, you had a question? Yes, I do have a question, actually. Um, what was the response during the bushfires to um, to the, the terrible disaster that uh, struck wildlife? Um, and uh, and from my memory as being a wildlife person, uh, it was pretty modest. And, uh, and I've given a serve to several people on council about it, as well as the state, uh, state member, um, the, there was nobody um, from council, nobody from state government, nobody from national parks, nobody from anywhere who uh, assisted um, the volunteers who were dealing with the what disaster that struck wildlife. Certainly, in the in the almost 360 degrees fires that surrounded Braidwood, um, I'm wondering if there's been any uh, movement to in the community recovery and resilience. Um, programs to, to take into consideration um, some kind of assistance uh, at a volunteer level or some sort of management level of uh, meeting the wildlife, like the disaster that, with, that comes with fires. I think yeah. people are reasonably well catered to. Uh, I might start that first, uh, if I Thanks. may, and then, and then on to Jackie. Yeah. So, so immediately following the fires, we established uh, at a regional and a local recovery committee uh, at a, at a uh, regional scale, those members comprised uh, local land services, national parks, uh, EPA, a host of state agencies, as well as council. Um, the regional recovery plan or action plan uh, articulated uh, what were the, the responsibilities of which particular body. And, and so naturally, LLS responsible for, for livestock and the like and national parks with wildlife. And they were then the key conduit to engage with the uh, relevant wildlife community groups. Uh, council also contributed $10,000 uh, towards uh, the recovery and assistance for the, directly to the wildlife recovery groups. But beyond that bill, it was actually outside our patch. Um, we relied upon the, the expertise, which we don't have, uh, that was held by state agencies. But Jackie, has that issue been picked up in the draft uh, recovery and resilience plan? Um, it, it has by some of the community plans. And what we would hope to do with our volunteer program is link people who are interested in certain areas of, of community, such as uh, wildlife, to be matched with um, a structured program of how they can get involved. Um, so that's, that's in plan. It hasn't really happened yet. And I have to admit, Bill, that initially people were most concerned about others who'd lost their homes and so on. But this is an issue that when we look at recovery and mitigation and preparedness, wildlife will certainly factor into the, how we protect, uh, as Peter said, both our, our um, farm animals and our, um, our 
general natural wildlife. I know that in the plan, one of the things we talk about is the fact that you can't um, ensure your animals um, and that makes it tricky. Uh, for, uh, so, so they're kind of low on the totem pole for many people. So we are looking at how we can better do that. Thank you. Uh, finally, some other, it looks like you've taken a couple of slides out, Peter. Not me. Okay, well, I have one on aquatics and one on the arts. So um, let me just talk about the other programs we do. So we support the museums. We have two museums in Queanbeyan. One is the um, Queanbeyan Historical Museum and the other is the Print Museum. We've recently had a significant study done on the Print Museum um, and the collection there is quite significant and it is one of the only such museums in the state. Um, and there is all, also the Braidwood Heritage Centre, which has just received a, a $2 million government grant. So um, our, one of our, a couple of our team are involved in that project. The money is actually directly for the museum, but we're involved in, in talking about where that money goes and how it's used. We also look after all the community facilities across the LGA. And um, recently we've done an audit on how many there are. A lot of them are actually managed by 355 committees. So we're asking some of those committees if they want and or need council support um, some of our booking services and so on, but that will be a matter for the communities themselves to decide how much they want us involved. And finally, animal management. We run the pound, look after dangerous dogs, um, nuisance dogs, barking dogs, so our rangers will investigate any incidents. We also rehome um, dogs, so people come and, and buy them from the pound. We do um, chipping and licensing and so on. So that has, um, that's a, quite a big LGA for our rangers to be looking after, but they, they uh, get a lot of positive accolades for that. I just want to talk about Peter, and I don't know if the slides are there or not. They certainly were. Oh, we've, we've, we've got a question from Bill first. Oh, uh, right, yes. Okay. Sorry, um, could you tell me, I've, I've been asked to support, um, uh, what if I get on council, that is of course, um, uh, cat containment policies expansion yes. of, can you tell me where, how far uh, that notion has been um, spread throughout the QPRC? I yeah, believe it's in one suburb, but this was from Greenlee was a request. And I've got a little right. bit of information for you. Um, uh, I'm the vice president of Wild Care, which operates the entire um, QPRC area apart from NARG, which I'm the president of. And um, it, uh, uh, there were 69 animals that came to us, wildlife animals that came to us um, for in care as a result of cat attacks. God knows how many countless other animals were killed or indeed consumed by those cats um, in and around the, the, the whole um, wild care area. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, just in comparison, there were like four or 500 that came into care from dog attacks. Right. Um, and, and I'm just, I want to just, I'm, I'm just thinking about how I, we could approach it as a council, as a policy. I know you're fairly busy with, with dog restraint and dealing with dogs and pounds and that sort of stuff. Yes. And there's plenty of regulations about it, um, but they're still doing a lot of harm to the wildlife and probably children and probably adults. Um, uh, and but the, the, the big thing is, it seems to be that cats, you know, we all know that cats are terribly destructive of wildlife, but in, in, particularly in the urban areas, I actually think there probably will be an increase in pressure to bring about cat, cat containment policies. Yeah. Have, have we, you seen any of that? Or? Yes, definitely. Um, we've, in the new areas of Gugong, there will be a cat containment policy. The area of Trali has have also indicated that they want a cat containment policy, the new areas, and also um, Elmsley in Bungendore want cat containment areas. There, um, we've been requested to look at what, where else we could uh, put cat containment areas in. It's trickier to do it in existing areas, not impossible, but there would have to be a phasing because people who have cats would need to 
can either keep them indoors and declaw them or whatever, or construct those cat run things. So we need to give people, if we're going to do it in the existing areas, we need to give people a bit of time to comply. You but we're probably certainly- probably find some moves from, from Green Lee by the sounds of things. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So certainly we'd be prepared to look at wherever anybody wants one, but noting that there are measures that we need to take over time rather than just imposing it quickly. Yes, um, sorry, I'll keep going, Katrina. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, just to update, the Environment and Sustainability Advisory Committee asked the Council to look at extending the areas that the cat containment policy applied to, um, initially adjacent to those areas, so Jumping Creek Estate uh, has it, so it makes sense to, to include it in Greenlee and some of the other um, rural residential areas and then to progressively and to start a conversation with the community about extending it across the LGA. Um, and from what we've just been told, it sounds like the council is looking at that. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Once people hear that we're doing it in one area, um, we, we get more requests to have a look at it across the LGA. You might keep going, Jackie. I've got, I found yep. those slides that were hidden, apparently. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I just want to say about dangerous dogs. Um, we only can investigate when we either see it or get a complaint. Mm. So, um, uh, performing arts and visual arts are very popular areas. The Q and the B, so the Q Performing Arts Centre and what we lovingly call the B, Bicentennial Hall, has been... Um, refurbished due to a, a grant we received a couple of years ago. So that's they've both become uh, very enviable spaces. What you see there is a, um, a preview of the 2022 launch, which is going to cover for the launch, which is going to happen next Monday night. So there's a series of programs, of theatre performing arts programs that happened at the Q. We'll have music at the B and we have lots of spaces around them. The bar areas of both um, facilities have some some great space to, be, to allow us to do what we're going to call a fringe program. So again, COVID made us realise that we need to activate smaller programs as well. So that'll be things like comedy, cabaret and so on. The visual arts, we have some specific things. So the um, Quimby and Pallarang Art Awards um, are very popular. This year they were supported by Bendigo Bank and they have said that they're keen to progress that support. Uh, it's an acquisitive first prize. Um, and the art goes on sale for a few weeks. So anybody can go in and, and buy the, um, the uh, lovely pieces that are done. Uh, there's also a newly introduced youth award, a people's choice award, Bendigo pick and several others. So that's great for our visual artists. And there are a lot of them in this LGA who are very talented. We also were gifted Ruston House several years ago. This is an historic building used to be part of the old Queen Bean Hospital. In fact, I believe it's the Fever Ward. Um, it's been completely refurbished through grant and it now operates as an art centre. It's pretty much fully booked uh, next year. So it offers hanging space, like uh, exhibition space, as well as a workshop space. We haven't run the Queen Bean Palarang Arts Trail since 2019 but we're looking at whether we should run this again next year. And this is about uh, a couple of weekends of people being, uh, of artists opening their workshops so that visitors to the region can go and see the artists in their natural habitat, if you like, working on what, whatever it is they do. And so we produce a map of the area and people at their leisure go um, and have a look and have a chat to our artists. That would be well supported by the Braidwood artists community yes. i can assure yes. you indeed yeah yeah um, jackie you'll be impressed to know that i had exactly that same tennis racket in 1976 <laughs> yes um and finally our aquatics centers there are four pools an indoor and an outdoor pool at queenbian pool at braidwood pool at bungandore pool at captain's flat and as you see down the bottom there our um wet play area that was funded for Queen Bee in a couple, couple of years ago, in 2019, I think it opened. So um, pools are very popular. They're also a bit of a money pit. So we set aside maintenance each year. Uh, the Braidwood pool has recently had been retiled and had its pump, pump service looked at. There is a million dollar grant for Braidwood to do some fairly um, 
hefty changes for the surrounds and that's uh, that's the development application has been lodged and we're waiting on the team to approve that we're hoping that that work will happen in the off season all the pools are currently open we're back on full swimming lap swimming um, and squad training swimming lessons available at Queenbean and Braidwood uh, less is available at Captain's Flat and Bungador and we have a lot of trouble uh, often getting enough lifeguards and teachers in those areas. So we put out each year uh, to appoint people and get a lot of trouble. But at the moment, we're fully staffed with casuals and opening those pools for the rest of summer. Um, as you would have guessed, the Bungendore pool will be re replaced in the Bungendore Sports Centre or Regional Sports Centre. So um, that one hopefully will the shiny and new. So the captain's flat pool is the one that needs a bit of attention at the moment. So that's it for me. Happy to answer any questions. Any final questions for Jackie? Thanks, Jackie. And so we've, we've had Mike speak on the important stuff. We've had Jackie speak on the fun stuff. And now can I introduce Phil Hanson to talk about the big stuff? Thanks, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, very conscious of time and that we have been here a long time. So I'll, I'll certainly try and um, move through these. Um, it, as a bit of a snapshot of what the connection structure uh, looks like, there it is. So um, we've got about uh, nearly 190 staff in there and uh, my section's broken up into four distinct areas, uh, contracts and projects, utilities, transport and facilities and assets. And uh, under each one of those are the various activities that are managed by each one of those service managers. You go to the next one, Peter. Um, I think you saw that slide earlier on, but just to point out that, um, that there are quite a lot of assets in, uh, in council that we currently have. And uh, we spend a lot of time and money uh, looking after those assets, particularly in the roads assets and water and sewer assets. Some of the numbers are there on screen and um, when you start to add them all up, they, uh, they are certainly um, extensive and um, those assets exist for, uh, well, they exist in, in a variety of ways. They've, we've got some of those assets that have been there for quite some time and then we've got other assets which are relatively new. So next one, Peter. So if we look at the operational plan uh, in the 2021-22 20, uh, period, that's a uh, snapshot of the expenditure across there. So we're spending about $50 million um, in, uh, in this year to, uh, to undertake uh, operational type activities, which usually are maintenance and repairs and, um, and, and those type of things that, that go with it. Um, certainly some, some quite big sums go towards our roads and, uh, and our water and sewer. Um, as well as our plant and fleet. And, uh, and the, there's, uh, that, that's reflective of the amount of the asset that we do have and the various improvements and, uh, and additions that we need to do uh, to those uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, next slide, Peter. So to find um, details around how we maintain our assets, Council does have a web page. This is just a, a grab of that. Um, it's under the roads and uh, footpaths section of it. In there, you'll find the maintenance grading schedule, and if, uh, amongst the other things, there's some details around some of those other ones. And the next slide just gives you a bit of a picture of how we present that. Um, certainly, if you want to go and look at the uh, grading policy that's been adopted by Council, um, then it's there. And uh, the effort that we put in annually meets the um, meets the level of service that's been detailed in that um, in that policy. Um, we note uh, typically sort of a month out what roads are going to be um, graded at that time, and then we also and it's just off the page. It's uh, it's not on uh, it's not on this grab, but it's certainly on the web page. We then cover off the roads that have been done. Um, the point to to make, I suppose, is that um, whilst we we provide that detail. Uh, it's it's in advance of us doing it. Um, things like you know we've got we're expecting 80 90 millimeters of uh, rain in uh, in various areas uh, over over the weekend coming up, and it's going to just play havoc with our programs and what we can deliver. The next one, Peter. So the maintenance that we do is again wide and varied. Um, so certainly we've got lots of uh, unsealed roads that we maintain uh, in accordance with the policy. 
some of our higher traffic roads get maintained up to four times a year or get graded up to four times a year. Um, and then we've got some other roads that, uh, that uh, aren't graded, um, uh, sort of are graded about once every three years. Um, and so that's spelled out in the policy. And, um, and like I said, it's, uh, the, um, the program is uh, designed around that. Um, we, we, even our sealed roads, when we, when we go to look at sort of um, what we need to do on those, we often find that uh, the pavements and things under our sealed roads are, are very thin. They don't have gravel, and that's reflected in what you see now with a bit of wet weather. Um, and it just comes out as, uh, as pavement failures and those sort of things as we go. We'll certainly patch those, but to fix them long term requires a full reconstruction of the road. Some of the other things we do are the, the, um, the bitumen ceiling, um, some pictures there after our patching, we construct footpaths. Um, as well as uh, constructing new roads um, and, uh, and rehabilitating old roads. Uh, next slide, Peter. Apart from roads, we have water and sewer assets. Um, the, uh, the, again, our, our water and sewer assets are quite extensive. We have a lot of assets underground. Um, in addition to what's underground, we have, uh, we have quite a few uh, assets above ground that we, we look after as well. Um, lots of things come into our sewer. Um, picture there in the middle is, is a lump of wood that's turned up in a pump. Um, and so that had to travel through the sewer system and, um, and get lodged in the pump and jam the pump. And so we've got to then pull that out because um, that, uh, that then impacts on, uh, on our transfer and sewage around the place. So um, the, a lot of the infrastructure, particularly in Queen Anne and uh, as well as in Bangador and Braidwood is, is old. Um, and uh, we have programs to gradually replace those, but it's a big job because there are quite uh, quite significant lengths of our water and sewer um, that need, need to get replaced. Next slide, Pat. So to support some of the things that we do, we buy a lot of plant, and you would have noted in that uh, operational slide there was some money set aside for plant. Here's some uh, some pictures of some recent plant that we've bought and some prices that are uh, attached to them. They aren't cheap. Um, we, we, uh, we try and um, cycle these items of plant uh, so that we can actually sell them and not lose significant amounts of money on them down the track, but we certainly get our value out of them as, uh, as they work for us. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, reflective of, of what we do, um, certainly graders are a big, uh, a big item for us and, uh, and trucks and um, they support our operational activities as well as our capital activities as well. So next one, Peter. So in addition to things that we do ourselves, we have other people out there doing a whole bunch of things as well. So Mike's already mentioned that we've got three, you know, the three main development areas for us are uh, Tralee, um, the, uh, the, the North Bangalore area and, uh, and Gugong. And um, each of those development areas, each of those developers are out there building assets that, that uh, at the end of what they build, get handed over to council. So if you go to the next slide, we then end up picking up things like uh, reservoirs. Um, we, uh, we have to provide additional connections into our network that we currently have. So uh, all that gets added to what we then have to take on and look after. And in addition to, uh, to water, we've, uh, we pick up sewage assets. Um, the picture on the left there is the Dugong um, recycled water plant. And uh, the picture on the right is a recycled water plant that's going in at um, Bakendor. So, so again, all of these are development related. And, uh, and certainly we, um, we end up then having to run these things. So, uh, so picking up a new sewage treatment plant, at the end of the day, there'll be a hundred million dollars spent on that um, uh, series treatment plant at Google to build it and uh, and then we need to then pick it up and then run it and replace it uh, into the future so it becomes a long-term asset that council needs to uh, consider how it's uh, how it's going to run that uh, as we move forward yes Katrina uh, thank you um, Phil can you tell us what the recycled uh, water uh, plant at Bungendore will be what the recycled water will be used for yeah, so at the moment we're, um, we've got a couple of um, destinations for the recycled water. Certainly the new um, sporting precinct there will have recycled water go to it. We, um, we want to run it up into mixture and oval as well. 
and uh, we're out there looking for some for private um, private customers at, at the same time. And so we're quite happy to sell this product to, um, to other other people. And um, and it should be of a quality that would allow us to um, to typically use it for irrigation and those secondary water quality uh, uses that um, that happen around town. Thank you. Um, so in addition to water and sewer assets, we get a whole bunch of other assets. Uh, again, just some, some typical pictures. We pick up parks, we pick up ovals, we pick up footpaths, roads, um, stormwater, all of those things that, um, that get built when a subdivision gets built, uh, get handed over to council and uh, they become general assets that we then need to look after and, uh, and manage into the future. Like Peter said, a lot of these assets end up, you, you need to um, not so much replace them, but you certainly need to do major work on them at the sort of 10 year to 15 to 20 year mark. Um, particularly roads, we need to uh, we need to reseal or resurface roads um, on a, on about a ten year cycle. Um, otherwise, if you don't, then um, you, the longevity for that particular road then drops off very very significantly after the after that if you don't do things like resealing. So there there again um, things that get added to our maintenance portfolio and uh, need to be considered as we uh, as we pull in more assets with developments like uh, the Gugons and Trollies and, uh, and Bugadol. It, it, it's worth adding at that point, Phil, that uh, in, the, in the assessments undertaken by IPART, it was demonstrated that um, from greenfield developments such as a Gugong or a, or a Trollies and so forth, uh, the, the maintenance and replacement, which, which is measured through depreciation, those annualised costs don't meet, uh, uh, sorry, exceed the rates that are collected for those particular new developments. So uh, there's often a misconception that uh, there's new rates being generated by, by uh, new development. That is true. But the value, because of rate capping and the structure of the rating system, means that the value of the rates collected do not cover the, the assets that have been inherited in those new developments alone, as far as their maintenance and ongoing uh, renewal goes. Thanks, Phil. Right, so um, so apart from operational things, we do we do lots of capital work. So um, what I've listed here again is the 21-22 capital programs for the various sections of council. The transport and facilities, um, a lot of our capital um, goes into installing new bridges around the place. Um, we we look at road constructions uh, and uh, and um, as well as bitumen and seal extensions and uh, rehabilitation and development of. Um, of, uh, of a variety of roads as well. So in the transport and facility section, there's about $24 million. And uh, further on, I'll just um, sort of zoom in on some of these. Um, in utilities, stormwater or fleet, we are, again, it's about a $20 million um, spend on capital in the, in the current year. And again, you can see that that capital is spread right across our portfolio. It covers um, stormwater fleet, um, water and sewer assets uh, as they go. Um, just a, a thing to point out, the, we, we are building um, uh, water and sewer assets out of Bungador on behalf or you know, for the new Bungador development because um, we've chosen to do it that way and the developer pays for that and we, we build it so, um, so that we have a big hand in the quality of, uh, of what actually gets built by those developers uh, because we're building it. Um, Contracts and projects is, is sort of uh, is responsible for the, the larger of the, of the capital spend every year. Um, they've, they've got about $100 million worth of work in, uh, in their budget this year. And, uh, and you can see the list of activities there um, and, the, uh, and the values that are there. The civic and cultural precinct is, um, is code for the new office building in, uh, in the middle of, um, in the middle of Quibian. So that's a big, uh, big chunk of that. And, uh, and of course, the uh, Caribbean sewer treatment plan upgrade is, is another big chunk of that, with that as well. So, if, uh, do, if you were looking for details on our capital programs, again, I'll point you at our webpage. Uh, all the details are there. Uh, we update it as often as we can um, and, uh, and provide as much update as we can through our web uh, webpage for, uh, for most of these projects. Thanks, Mark Peter. Um, so, to decide what. Sorry, we've got a question from Margot. Sorry, Margaret. 
Yeah, hi Phil. Um, just one query. Where are things at with the noise study for the Edwin Land Parkway? I didn't see that in any of your the slides that you've had. Yeah, so it's it's funded from a previous year, so it's not going to show up on that. But we're we're at a point where I've, I've got to schedule a workshop with the new council um, on the outcomes of the study that's been done there, and uh, and we'll do that, and then uh, then that'll that'll. Um, uh, become known to everybody then. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's various ways that, that projects do turn up. And Peter did touch on it earlier. And um, and we, we do a lot of strategic planning around the place. So um, back in 2008, uh, Council undertook uh, quite a lot of traffic planning and traffic strategy work that came up with a, um, a strategy to provide road network that considered all of the development that was proposed for Queanbeyan uh, in the Quimian area um, right out to 2031. So that included the, uh, the trailer development, the Pugong development, all the infill development, Jumping Creek and all that sort of, uh, all those sort of um, infill and, um, and um, uh, additional developments that we knew about at the time. And the strategy then identified a whole bunch of road improvements and some of those road improvements um, that you see there, they're quite familiar to people. And, um, and we've spent quite a, quite a lot of uh, effort and uh, been quite successful in securing grants to, uh, to deliver these projects well before uh, they were, they were um, demanded by the developments that were occurring there. A couple of um, uh, things to, uh, to uh, I, I guess, say that we still have work to do. So there's a section of Old Coomer Road, um, which Peter's pointing out there, that's still to be done. Um, it's not needed until uh, quite a few years out or a number of years out now, so we're still getting ready for that. Um, and, uh, and then uh, also the, um, the uh, intersection of roof that's around the place, um, they've got uh, sort of demands as they, into the out years and, um, and, and they're, they're certainly on our agenda to keep, um, keep pushing and get them done as we go. Part of this strategic planning included what was the, um, added to the voluntary planning agreement that was accepted by Gugong developers, and um, and they've paid or they they they're required to pay for these roads as they go, um, and certainly that was set up initially, and that was how these roads were to be funded. But again, council was very fortunate to get some grants which allowed the work to get accelerated um, and get done. Next slide, Peter. So some of the other big capital projects, we'll just um, step through these. Um, the Queenie Series Treatment Plan, if you press the button again, Peter, it'll show a red square where the new plant is going. So the picture there is of the old plant and uh, it's down beside the Malongaway River. Uh, it's in the ACT, so it's located in the ACT. We need to replace that plant. Um, and uh, the red area is the area that we've targeted to build a new plant uh, there. On the right hand side, there's a, a bunch of details as to what we're targeting for there. The plant uh, typically is going to be a 75,000 EP plant and, uh, and will uh, improve and, um, and develop the uh, treatment process that's uh, currently there and, uh, and add a whole lot more of reliability um, and robustness to the, uh, to the process that we currently have. Next slide, Peter. Uh, the, uh, the new plant will consist of uh, a significant um, amount of infrastructure and uh, the picture on the left is, uh, is the um, concept layout for it and the details on the right are the different elements that are going to go and make up that, um, that plant. The new plant will be, uh, will be well clear of the one in 100 year flood level. Um, unfortunately, the current plant is affected or affected by uh, uh, floods. Um, as they go through, and I think the next slide shows the um, the flood the flood effect over the old plant. So, so certainly elements of the old plant gets inundated in a flood event, um, a particular one in a hundred flood event, and, uh, and the new plant will be uh, will be constructed in uh, on land that will be clear of uh, clear of that. So that won't be a inhibiting thing. So we've got some time frames there. This this project is is. But it's, it's long lead times to actually uh, start construction, but we're, we're certainly pushing down the line uh, now of getting our approvals. We've got to get ACT approval through the EIS process and a bunch of other regulators that we've got to get uh, approvals from. 
and, uh, and, and have all that in place before we actually go to contract for the construction of this particular plant. Um, still lots of things to work out and uh, determine how we move forward. And uh, as this gets worked up and developed, um, we, we bring various uh, decision points to council and, uh, and the new council would, will certainly be considering um, the, the uh, progress of this uh, particular project. Um, the Queen of Civil, uh, the Civic and Cultural President, I think Peter's covered off on that enough. Um, I don't know that I need to talk any more about that particular one, but again, it's a project that, um, that council staff are supervising the delivery of it. And so we've engaged a contractor, to, a constructor to do that. And, uh, and our contracts and projects branch are, um, are responsible for delivering this project in accordance with the brief that's been made. So next one, Peter. Um, a project that's been going on for some time now and it still has- no, no, We've got another question from Ginny. Oh, sorry. Yep. Sorry. Um, sorry, Phil. So yeah, the office, uh, the new office construction. So the yes. contract has been let. Is that all of the contracts in terms of the fit out and everything? Or is it just the main construction that's been let to date? Uh, so it's, it's uh, everything. So there's an element of fit out that, that council has to do, which will be the sort of the fine, the fine detail but it's, it's everything for the whole building. Okay, and completion time? I uh, think that was uh, end of end of 22. Uh, yep. And then and then fit out occupation by March 23, as it said earlier in the session. Yeah. Yep. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, so the Neriga Road uh, project is, um, is certainly been a project that's um, been asked for by the community for quite some time. It's a major link between the south coast, uh, particularly Nowra and, uh, and Braidwood. Um, there's numerous spots you can turn off along the way and you can head up to Goulburn across the Shellhaven River. So it's a key, it's a key route for us. Council was successful in getting uh, a significant grant for this project. So I think we've got something like $30 million for this work. And, um, We've been progressively doing it. There's still um, a stage, uh, the current stage that we're on needs to be finished. Um, we've been hampered by wet weather. Um, we were planning on getting a significant section of that uh, sealed before Christmas, but it's looking like the wet weather's gonna beat us and uh, it'll now get pushed until after Christmas. Um, the bits that need to get uh, done that are, are currently undone is the intersection of that Narragut Road and the King's Highway. There's an intersection upgrade that's gotta be done. And, um, and again, we're still sort of um, negotiating our way through the approvals process for that particular intersection. Uh, once we get that, uh, we'll kick that off and, uh, and build it. Again, it's likely to be uh, in the new year um, before, we, uh, before we kick that off and uh, get that done. And then uh, apart from uh, then, then the, the um, final section uh, that we have, um, we, we have the majority of money to get that finished, but we're still looking for some additional funds to finish off the very last unsealed section of that road. Um, the, uh, the, the other intention too is that, um, that we're, we're out looking for uh, money to improve some of the sealed sections of that road um, as they've um, progressively moved forward over time as well. Uh, next one, so Emberona Drive, Mike spoke about it as the, um, as the road leading into, um, into Trawee and into the Poplars area there. Um, for us, it's a, it's a capital project that again, council staff are delivering. It's a $23 million project. Um, it's uh, fully grant funded and, um, and we're, we're sort of getting to the tail end of this job now. So it looks like that um, open to traffic will be sort of in the new year. And uh, and uh, and we, we should be able to get that knocked off so that it uh, coincides with um, with when the trailer residential development area is also ready for um, for traffic down there as well. So councils are only constructing down to the Jerrymonda Creek, which is at the bottom right hand side of that picture. There's still probably another sort of two kilometres of road past that that has been constructed by the trailer developers uh, and not by council. Uh, of course, that road will get handed to council and uh, we'll have to look after it once it's up. Next one, Peter. Um, an Arrow Street upgrade again is another, another big project for us. Um, it's a total project of $15.5 million. Um, it's, it's really delivering one stage or a two stage approach. And the first stage is between Lowe and Crawford Street. Um, 
there's uh, the funding is is ten million dollars worth of grant and five and a half million dollars of loans that council would need to take out to finish that off. Um, there's the, the picture there is the, is the current concept and uh, it, it involves the widening of the footpath areas to make them available to businesses to occupy and, uh, and use as part of their business there and really to liven up the street and uh, the main street and provide better, um, better access through there for pedestrians as well as people who want to access the businesses um, all the way through there. We, we need to be mindful that it is a state road still. So you can go to the next slide, Peter, if you want. Yep. Um, it is a state road, which, which means anything we do there, we've got to get approval from Transport for New South Wales. We're still in that approval stage for the concept um, that's proposed there. And um, we're wanting to push forward as soon as we can. But um, it, it's, a, it's a great project and it'll continue to um, make the centre of Caribbean uh, just a little bit more attractive. Uh, and then there's some dates and, and delivery time on the screen there. Um, Cactus Flat Road is another big project for us. Um, so we, we, are, um, we are in a position now where we're able to start the work on that. So we were given the money, uh, not all in one lump sum. So we were given it across a four year period. And um, the first year was really to get some design done and get some um, assessments done so that we can uh, move in and actually start constructing things. And now for the next uh, three years, we get $3 million per, per year. So council has um, considered that how we get that money and uh, what's on the screen there is the plan to roll that money out over the next three years. Um, and, uh, and the intention is to really address the whole length of the road all the way from Bry Sharrow Road into Captain's Flat. And um, the, uh, the, the treatment that we will do there is what we call pavement stabilisation. So it's a lot of in situ stabilisation with some um, with with some extra material added. Um, before we can do the stabilising, we've got to widen out the drainage. So that's some uh, some additional work that's got to get done um, prior to the actual road work getting done. But the stabilisation process is very quick, and um, we can we can sort of get um, you know a five kilometre section done. Um, we would get that done in, in four to five weeks without a problem um, and then continue on. So, so it is pretty quick. And we've already done some of that treatment on the road. There's some uh, green sections which have already had that treatment and, uh, and that really should transform that road from the current poor uh, condition, which we're very aware of, um, to, uh, to effectively quite a, quite a new road as, uh, as it goes all the way into Captain's Flat. Uh, another uh, project that's due to commence is the uh, there's a section of Tarrigo Road that um, we are upgrading. The, the funds from this have come from contributions from the Veolia um, uh, Waste Transfer or the Waste um, Treatment Place uh, there. And um, the part of, of uh, them moving their trucks along that road, they've paid some uh, upgrade works, uh, paid for some upgrade works to be done. Um, we're doing it in two stages. We want to start the first stage very soon. Uh, we're just finalising some plans and um, property acquisition. And, uh, and then that's another job that will start very, very soon and spend between two and a half and three and a half million dollars to get that done. A couple other projects underway, Bundle Car Park. Um, again, it's nearly completed, so it's really just there for information. And the next one is a Bundle Roundabout in the same position. It's um, it's, it's well advanced and um, we, we are again hampered by wet weather, but we're looking to get that done as soon as we can um, to improve that intersection there. Um, some of the other things that we do, um, we've, we've had an extensive bridge renewal program over the last um, three, four years. Um, we've, we've been successful in, uh, in getting grants uh, for the replacement of bridges. Here's a picture of the Silver Hills Road Bridge before and after. Um, we need to note that it's, um, uh, it's a 50-50 grant, so what we get from the government, we have to match, so uh, we have to put that in the budget. Um, next one, Peter. Round four, there's, there's the bridges that, um, that we've been funded out of round four. Um, so again, we've finished the Gilly Bridge, but Greedy Creek Bridge, we're about to commence. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a good bridge to do. Round five is Brickfield Bridge. 
Next one, Brick, yeah, Brick Hill Bridge. And again, 50-50 uh, grant between council and, uh, and the grant provider. And, um, and that's got to get, uh, we haven't, haven't commenced that one either. Um, we also have another program, the Dixon Country Bridges Program. And out of that, we've got funding for Fox Low Bridge, the Hereford Hall Road Bridge, and the Wallace's Gap Bridge. Um, the funding is slightly different. We get 80% from the grant provider and 20% council has to, um, has to fund. Uh, of course, the Fox Lake Bridge, we've started that project um, and we'll, we'll, we'll get that finished as soon as we can and the other ones are yet to be done. Um, on the back of uh, the bushfires and, and the flood events that we have, we have the um, Disaster Recovery, recovery Fund um, that, that provides funding for bridges that were damaged in, in those events. And so the Ford Street Road Bridge was damaged during the fire uh, episode. And, um, and that's now been replaced. So you can see the, the photo there and the Little Bombay Road Bridge, um, that's the before photo. Um, that's actually been completed. We've dropped the box culvert into that and, uh, and that's also open again. Um, and, and Lions Bridge before and after, that one's been done as well. They were 100% um, grant funded. Uh, in addition to bridges, we, we also go for grants for fixing local roads. Um, some of the money that we've spent of recent times, there's a one and a half um, kilometre section on the Araluan Road just out of Braidwood, um, just from the, um, from the Majors Creek Road uh, heading south, and, uh, and that's been done, and it was funded um, 300000 from the uh, Fixing Local Roads Grant and the 100000 Council Contribution. The next one we got was um, Majors Creek Road, which we're working on now. Um, there's some that has been done and, and some that's still to be done on that road. So um, as I was saying before, the amount that we have to spend to actually fix that road up uh, is you know, way more than what we're getting out of the dark road. Um, mine is their contribution to that road. And the last one is a, uh, another grant for the Williamsdale Road. And the intention is that we want to as much as we can seal all of the unsealed sections of Williamsdale Road. Williamsdale Road is our most heavily trafficked unsealed road, and it's a great candidate to, uh, to get a seal on it. Um, we've still got some design work to do there, so I can't guarantee that we are going to get it all sealed, but we'll, we'll get as much of it done as we can. Um, it, you know, as I said, in addition to, um, to some of the money we get, we, we, we do get um, money to repair storm damage, some of the figures out of the different events that we've had, the bushfire and the two flood events are there on the right-hand side. It takes us some time and we are still spending the money from those programs to get our roads repaired. If you go to the next slide, Peter, we have lots of um, drainage repairs and lots of um, slips and, uh, and tree issues on roads. And the next slide, Peter, um, where, where we, we, have, um, we have lots of work to do. And um, the biggest, thing with this is I can't use council staff to do it. The condition of the grant is that I use contract staff. So we are then at the mercy of being able to get contractors to do it. And um, the, the, our, our staff have been working quite well and we're gradually working our way through this. But, um, but certainly it's a, it's, a, um, it's a bit of a patience game at times to, uh, to get things done. So I think, Peter, that's that the last one? It is. There we go. Look, that's that, that's a good point to, to finish up on, uh, Phil. So, so folks, right right across our LGA and many councils in the state, uh, we deliver through a mix of uh, council staff and contractors, suppliers, consultants, and the like. Uh, in many cases, some of the grants are tied to the use of uh, contractors to stimulate local economy, um, and in some respects, it's the availability of contractors and the nuances of the weather, uh, which significantly influence the streamlining and the sequencing of those particular projects as, as Phil has indicated. Look, that concludes the body of work we wanted to get through. Um, we have got through in the time frame that we had set aside. It's a lot of information to take in, obviously. Uh, the, the value you have, of course, is the session has been recorded. So once we have that archived on the website, you'll be able to go back and pause on it uh, later. Happy to take questions if you have any further. Uh, Caitlin uh, Flint is our, our contact for that, and we'll make that uh, information also available uh, on the website. Uh, but are there any other questions from the candidates in the room today, uh, no, most of which are uh, representing all the groups are here? 
Any other questions that we can help you with before we close? Well, great. Look, th thank you all. Uh, thank you for our staff for their time and commitment putting this presentation together. If you are successful, of course, much of the same you'll hear again as part of the induction processes on the uh, 29th of January and beyond. Uh, so again, uh, if you have further questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, we do uh, congratulate you on putting your hand up to be a candidate. Uh, we know we will have at least eight uh, new councillors uh, pending the results of the election. So therefore the learning for all of us and, and onboarding will be a significant exercise. Uh, it will also be a great opportunity for all of you to develop yourself through the, the professional development programs as a councillor. Uh, and we are obliged to, of course, publish uh, what you engage with and what we spend on and so forth going forward. But equally, we look forward to, uh, with your success as a councillor, adding uh, different energies and skills, insights and ideas into our operations, uh, because certainly the first 12 months is a period of review. Uh, uh, initially of, of services, uh, sorry, initially, of course, with our CSP delivery program and operational plan and our financial strategy and, and long-term financial plan attached to that. Uh, then, then a sequence of uh, standards for assets, services that we provide uh, and a refresh of, of a number of our policies. So a new council is obliged to revise all its policies in the first year or two of its term uh, and likewise to revise its organisation structure in the first year of its term. And, and the organisation structure is down what we call level three, which is the, the executive down through to the service manager level. At this point, it's all based, as we said earlier, on our service program and activity framework. It's been a long session. Uh, thank you all for your time and patience. Thanks again to staff for administering and, uh, and hopefully you enjoy uh, the, the, uh, the web video of, of today's proceedings. See you all in perhaps a couple of months uh, at, at our first meeting. Cheers and thanks, thanks to your time. Peter. That's good of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks to all the staff. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. Well, uh, well done. Thank all you. Right. Thank you. Thank you.